he can get all of today's awesomeness as well. All right, so here we go. So uh, this week, we're going to change gears ever so slightly. Last week, we talked a lot about the 3D printing industry. We looked at 3D modeling through the lens of actually manufacturing something. Well, today, we're going to change gears a little bit. I think last week I mentioned that every week going forward, we're going to be focusing our tool set and the product that we create on a very, very specific industry where 3D modeling is often found. This week, as you'd imagine from the, uh, the blog post, we're going to talk about architectural visualization. So we're going to be building some houses this week, okay? And specifically, we're going to talk about some new technology that will allow us to get to that end result a whole lot faster. Specifically, it's the pen tool, okay? The pen tool is awesome. And we're also going to throw a new wrench into this system and start talking about something called Booleans. And Booleans are great, but with, with, with great power comes great responsibility. We have to be very careful when we're using Booleans because we can very quickly and often do more damage to our mesh than we really need it to do. Um, we're also going to spend some time today talking about the snapping system inside of Moto because when we get to architectural visualization, we need to have a certain degree of accuracy that the, luckily for us, the snapping tools will afford us. 3D modeling and the ArcViz industry are, you know, they're a good fit. It's, a, it's one of those obvious connections between 3D modeling and architectural visualization. Um, in this week's blog post, I've given you some really great examples of where we could go with this. Because it's not just about making the model. Although that's an important element to what we're doing, it's really, excuse me, apparently D2L is like freaking out right now. I'm not even logged into D2L. Okay. Um, I've given you some really great examples down here at the bottom that really illustrates the power of architectural visualization inside of our 3D rendering application. It's not just about the model. What we're trying to do here is visualize something that's very large, something that would be very expensive to, you know, to build. Okay? Um, I, I do a lot of ArcViz, actually. You know, it's, it's one of those elements that uh, is a nice, nice application of the tool set. The rendering engine inside of Moto does a fantastic, fantastic job of allowing us to very quickly, and I mean very quickly, go in, construct something very simple like you see here, and then render it out. Clients love this. Come on in, you money. Clients love working with this type of artwork because it allows us to instantly see what this object is going to look like in all three dimensions. In addition, this, this stuff that we're going to talk about today also extends very naturally over into the game world. So if you're looking to be an environmental artist, uh, this, is, this is a very, very important topic of conversation that we're going to have. And it certainly is a whole lot of fun. I've done a whole series of ArcVids projects. Uh, you know, one I did a, a number of years ago that proved to be invaluable. It's a, whole lot, it's a whole lot easier to make something digitally and build something digitally than it is to actually build it in the real world. I was working on a client or working with a client that was um, planning on doing a renovation in her office and she wanted to add this kind of like web portal capsule thing in the middle of her office and it was this big kind of octagon shaped you know room where all the web designers were going to sit and hang out and they did all the plans they talked with the uh, the contractor and then she approached me and says Pat I really want to see what this thing is going to look like on the inside of my office before I throw down like 40 grand on the renovation costs the renovation and construction costs because it was going to be a big reno and I was like no problem. Let me come down to your office. I'm, I spent the entire day measuring all the walls and all the windows and taking you know, as accurate measurements as I could. And I built a one-to-one -one recreation of her office and then inserted this new construction object in the middle of the middle of her middle of her, you know, her office. And it proved to be an invaluable use of all of our time and resources because we made some changes. Once she was able to see precisely what the shape was going to look like on the interior of her office, we made some changes. We also made some connections that the architect had made. We, uh, we looked at the, uh, um, how far the doors were going to swing out. And there really wasn't enough clearance between the width of the door and these new, these new walls. So it was an invaluable, invaluable process. It's a whole lot easier to move a digital wall than it is to move a real wall, right? Which is another reason why ArcViz is so important, because it allows to get everyone on the same page instantly, right? There is no interpretation. There is no question as to what the thing is going to look like. We see what the final res uh, design and what the building is going to look like uh, from all angles. In addition, kind of piggybacking on what we talked about last week with 3D printing, uh, you know, this is another natural, natural fit of all this 3D printing technology. Um, in my office, I have a, a really cool house. Let me just go snag it real fast so you guys can get a, a good understanding of what I'm talking about. Uh, the ArcViz world is 
bubbling over into the, into the practical manufacturing world with, with our 3D printers. Here's a cool little house. I'll leave this up on my desk, but I just ask you to be very, very gentle with this. It is kind of a delicate model, and it took a significant amount of time to make. But it kind of shows you the direction we're going in. You know, once again, our designs can live in the real world. It's one thing to have a digital design of a house, but let's print it. Let's make all the walls. Let's stack it on top of each other. Now the client and the uh, you know can take it all apart, look at the floor plans and all three dimensions, see precisely what it looks like from a, from a number of different angles, and use that as the genesis of their decision making process. It's it's invaluable. It's really really great, and it certainly looks kind of cool when it's all. Stacked. This is on a little maker bot. See, little house, pretty cool. You can take all the levels off, and oh, there's that. there's my bedroom. You know, <laughs> it's it's cool. It really is an invaluable invaluable uh, tool. Uh, my parents. I'm doing this for my parents. Actually, they're in the middle of a renovation of their home, and uh, I've I've told them that once they the architect is zeroed in on the designs, give them to me. I'll make a model of it in 3D, and I'll make it so they can actually see what the house is going to look like before they spend a significant amount of money making the darn thing. So it's, a, it's an invaluable tool set, the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. I think for, for a lot of people, the ArcViz um, world is the, uh, the point of entry for a lot of people into the 3D world. If you take a, ba take a step back and look at it, uh, a lot of people kind of shuffle into the ArcViz world just based purely on the idea that there's a ton of work out there, right? There's a ton of ArcViz work out there, and the tool set has gotten to the point where it's not very expensive to do this anymore. It used to be, a, the, making an image like you see on the screen here, used to be a ridiculous, uh, ridiculous sum of money. Now, not so bad. I can do that in a day, right? Five years ago, to get into that quality of work would require software that was, you know, five or $6,000, and it would take me a couple days to do that. Now the price has come down. The technology, uh, the... Uh, 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 the maturity of the technology has got to the point where I can do this for a relatively inexpensive price point in comparison to what it was four or five years ago. So the ArcViz world is totally jumping into the bandwagon here, or jumping on the bandwagon and getting into the whole 3D modeling and visualization. One other thing, and this is obvious to us in the in, 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 in entertainment packages, is that we get to make our animations move, right? We get to make our buildings move. We can actually do fly-arounds and fly-throughs of, of all of our constructions and, uh, and show our client precisely what it's going to look like in movement. That is not something that traditional CAD applications and traditional um, drafting applications allow those users to do. It's something special for us. Um, you know, I have a, a very good relationship with Ken Fitzpatrick over in the uh, EDT department. Have any of you guys taken any of the EDT classes, the engineering, design, and technology stuff? They're the home for all the CAD stuff, all of the drafting classes. You know, they're, they're the hardcore, they're the engineers on campus, and we're the artists, if you will, okay? And um, Ken is often jealous of the fact that I can move my camera around, that you know, I can get a real-time preview of what the building looks like in three dimensions. He's working in two dimensions. He's working on elevations and floor plans, and I'm working in three dimensions, okay? A lot of the techniques and a lot of the ideas are the same though. How we construct a building in a CAD environment is almost identical to how we construct a building here in, the, in an entertainment you know, environment. The one persistent thing uh, that is critically important to all of this is scale. And we're going to also spend some time today talking about unit of measurements, uh, ways for you to very quickly understand how big something is, and then design to scale. Up until now, scale, well, last week I, I gave you, you know, a bounding box that you were allowed to play in for your medicine bottle, and your bottle had to fit within that box, right? Well, this week, I want you to try to build or construct your building to scale. Now, why would you imagine this is a really kind of important idea going forward? Yeah, and that's, that's really it. Everyone can, you know, I can make an object as big or as small as I want in the computer. But when we start incorporating real-world objects like windows and doors, it's good to do things to scale so that our brain has a point of reference, okay? There are standard door widths, okay? There are standard door heights. I think the, the standard door width is either 32 or 33 inches, something like that, okay? And almost every door on the face of the planet, well, not every face, not every door, but most doors 
uh, you know, that have made in the last five years are going to be 32 or 33 inches wide. That's a point of reference that I can use to figure out all the proportions and the dimensions of every other aspect of my model. It makes it a little bit easier knowing, uh, you know, having a good solid understanding of what seven feet looks like. Okay, because most, most doors are about seven feet tall. Uh, seven feet tall. Um, so scale is going to be a big factor today, and we're going to look at that here in a minute. Our homework and lab assignment this week are going to really focus our tool set and our energy on the architectural visualization world. As I mentioned a brief moment ago, you're building a house this week. Okay, you're building a house. Now this, is, this, this just isn't any house. I'm not supplying you with any asset or any sort of reference image. You're going to go out and find your own. You're going to build your own house or a house of your choosing. And I really would recommend it, uh, that it is your own house or your own apartment complex or what have you. Why? You have a point of reference. You already know what it looks like, right? You already know what your house looks like. The whole mission is going to be a whole lot easier if you use something that you see every single day. Um, I don't want to limit your creativity. In the past, people have gone on and done really famous homes. I think uh, last semester I had someone do a Frank Lloyd Wright home, which was, which was really cool, which is really cool. Um, but you know, you're free to do whatever house that you want, but make it easy on yourself. Making a house is not a simple process. It's not impossible, but it's not simple either. There's a lot of moving components to this, especially when you start plugging in windows and doors. Okay? So keep it simple. Make your own home. Okay. So we're making a house. This is going to be a two-part assignment. This week, we're going to spend all of our energy talking about the construction techniques for architectural homes. Okay? Um, next week, we're going to change gears and talk about the texturing and the rendering of our house to make it look really rad. Because we need to introduce some new texturing concepts that are purpose-built for the architectural visualization world. In that, what I'm talking about specifically is an idea called tiling textures. And that's going to happen next week in a big capacity. So model this week. Next week, texturing. So two-part two-part assignment. At the conclusion of this homework assignment, you're absolutely going to be submitting all of your geometry. And the next week, you're going to be submitting the final design with all the, uh, with all the textures on. Okay. Questions on what we're going to be doing for our homework. We'll come back and talk about some of the details here momentarily. Our lab assignment this week is a softball pitch. Okay. We'll come back to it a little bit later, but basically your job during lab is to find pictures, reference elements that you can use uh, as, the, as the starting point for your design. Okay? All 3D modeling begins and ends with reference. We have to have a collection of images that leads our brain towards the natural decision making process in this environment. Even more so when you're talking about architectural visualization because now things need to look a very specific way. Okay? You know, that's the good and the bad thing about ArcVis to a certain degree is that everyone knows you know, what a window looks like. Everyone knows what a door handle is going to look like. Uh, if we're off, if we're wrong, people are going to recognize that pretty quickly. Scale and proportion is also another thing that we can't forget this week. Something I'll touch base on here momentarily. All right, questions, questions, questions on what we're going to be doing. So don't let the image fool you. You're not necessarily, being, not necessarily building uh, the Simpsons house. I just thought it was cool that someone one year bought, or someone built the Simpsons home. Uh, that was a good job, by the way. So I, I used it as my feature image. It used to be a different image, now it's the Simpsons house. So I just think it's cool, that's all. Anyways, all right. Let's jump in and start exploring the art of architectural visualization. All right. Okay. So before we get started today uh, on the ArcViz stuff, I want to spend some time talking about some really neat tools that will help us build some really great shapes inside the computer. If you were um, last week, there's a number of different ways that you could have used the profiles uh, that we talked, or excuse me, that radial sweep command. Um, but in one of the different things that we touched based on was the application of the pen tool. I want to kind of dive into the pen tool with a little bit more detail because the pen tool works fundamentally different than the way the pen tool works over in Photoshop or in Illustrator. It's unfortunate that they share a common name because a lot of people approach the pen tool with the idea that it's going to work like the busy you know, pen tool that you see over in Photoshop, but it's very, very different. The pen tool is great because it allows us to very quickly go in and, custom, uh, and create a custom polygonal shape. Now, you've got to bear with me for a second. I've been using curves all morning. But there it is. There's the pen tool. Okay, that's what the icon looks like. 
And the pen tool, when active, allows us to draw custom shapes anywhere in our three-dimensional scene. It's also, it's also worth pointing out that the pen tool is absolutely going to use the location of your work plane okay, as the place where all of these shapes are going to be created on. So pay attention to that work plane because that's the, the plane inside of our three-dimensional scene that your shape is going to be made. So let's check it out. The pen tool, with its defaults, is going to basically allow you to do this. Now you click once, you just get a vertex. You click twice, you get an edge. But the third time you click, you're going to create a custom polygon. Okay? And this is really great because now we can very quickly go in and block out organic shapes without too much effort. Okay? And we're free to do whatever we want here with, it, with this. I can click, go click happy and do, 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 do. Awesome. I don't know what that is, but it's an interesting shape nonetheless. If you look very carefully, yeah, go ahead. You can. They're, we're going to get to snapping here in a minute, but yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You can barely see. So we have, um, we had someone asked if we keep the lights on because of the exact same reason. That is, that is one bank of lights. Let, let's try a different combination, see what we get. Maybe there's a different alternative. So that's it off. There's, there's a different one. There's the front ones. And there's kind of the back ones. So it's like, pick which one's, which one's better? Yeah, they're all kind of horrible. Yeah, it's... Um, keep the backlights on. Well, there really is no backlights. There's like, there's the middle. We get the middle. Um, and then if I have, let's see. Yeah, and then I got the front and the back. So crazy. I don't understand the lights in here. There's so that one. And there's that one. And there's that one. <laughs> is it any different? Let's do it again. So there's that one, which is the middle. And then we have front and back, which is stupid, but whatever. Uh, and then we also have uh, front, does that does that look like the exact same pattern to you? No, it's like there's the is the that one light. See if you look back in the in the back there, that's the difference. That's the silliest thing I've ever seen on the face of the planet. That is absolutely crazy. The original designers of these lights need to be like shot or something because that's just crazy. Um, Like that, or those guys. Oops, oops, oops. Like that? Like that. Now, okay, I think that's, that's about as good as we're going to get. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, um, and I'll zoom in to make it a little bit easier, too, on everyone. I'll try to. Okay. Notice that when I'm working with the pen tool, or while the pen tool is still active, we get these little light blue squares everywhere. These are control points. And these are really, this is really cool because we can go in and edit the location of all these control points while the tool is still active. So in every sense, it's a live tool. And I can very quickly go in and change all this stuff uh, you know, as, I, as I need to go around. Uh, so I can just grab one of these little points here, move it around. I'm ready to go. Now, there's always going to be one that's gold. And that gold one is really important. It denotes the active control point within inside the pen tool. If I was to, let me see, I'm going to go down and I'm going to click on this one. And you're going to, and you're going to notice that it's going to go gold. There we go. Boom. Now, watch what happens if I was to click right here off of that gold point. What happened? I created a new one. Okay. So the computer is always going to create a new control vertice immediately following the active control point, okay? And it's always going to do it after, so please be aware of this, okay? This is one of those buyer beware moments where only you can prevent forest fires. People get click happy with the pen tool and they, they find themselves in this tornado of really, you know, cross geometry and really and things that are just monumentally screwed up. You've got to be very careful where you click, okay? There's kind of a fine line of when you're on the point and when you're off the point. Can't do what? You can't, okay, you can't move it all around. Let's take a look. OK. 
click up here. Now move no, around. Okay. Yeah. You know, I think I think Yamani's experience here is something that is worth kind of mentioning and, and drawing focus to. Okay. And that's really the, the, the fine line of being on the point and being off the point. You know you're on the point when it turns gold. And then you just left click and drag and you can change the location at uh, you know wherever you want. If you just slightly miss it, boom, it's going to make a new one, and you can see the, the nightmare of, nightmarish situation that I have found myself in. So just be careful. You've got to be really careful with all this stuff. It's uh, The pen tool gives you great, great power, but with great power comes great responsibility. Okay? Well, this, you're driving this machine here, so be careful. Okay? The pen tool allows us to, to create very custom shapes quickly, but the product of the pen tool is always going to be an end gone, okay? It's always going to be a surface, and that's also really nice because once I drop the tool, okay, spacebar to drop the tool, you can see that what I get is vertexes, okay? It's just an end gun. So I can continue to edit the shape after I've initially created it. Now, with something like this, you're absolutely going to have to go in and, uh, and edit it. You could use a number. Of, if I wanted to take this into the you know, production or something, uh, you know, I had to you know, slice it up using maybe like edge slice. Oops. So it really is a surface just like any other. There's nothing magical about it. Now we're on our way. Okay. Now we've got quad polygons across the entirety of that little, little shape. Okay. So you're always going to get a surface that's constructed from a whole series of, of vertexes. Okay. Hmm? So actually it brings, up, brings me to the next point. The pen tool kind of changes its behavior based on what mode it's in. Okay. And there's actually a couple different different things you can create with the pen tool. I've created a polygon. However, if you go over to the tool options, let me just get rid of this shape here. And let's uh, refire the pen tool. Check it out. Here are the pen tool options. These are all the different things that we can create with the pen tool. So we can create polygons, we can create lines, we can create single vertices that are just floating off in our three-dimensional space. We can create some really neat things called spline patches and of course subdivision surfaces. For me, I find myself almost always just exclusively creating polygons, okay? Because there are better way to make vert lines, and there's certainly better way to make floating vertices within our scene. So just be aware that keep this type to polygon. Now, when the polygon type is enabled, there's actually some other different uh, things that we can do with the polygon tool, or excuse me, with the pen tool. And that brings us to this second category, this line down here. I'm going to collapse all of my pen options here for a second. And I'm going to go into the wall mode categories of tool or uh, choices. Right now, my wall mode is off. Now, this is specifically designed and purpose built for the architectural visualization crowd. Because what the pen tools are going to allow us to do is to very quickly, with, while the wall mode is active, create a floor plan. Let's just turn it on. So you have inner, outer, and both sides. I'll talk about the nuance of all three of these choices here in a minute. But for the time being, I'll just create inner. All right. I'm going to navigate my OpenGL viewport so that the work plane sitting on the XC axis. There we go. So kind of on the floor, right? And I'm going to click. Once I get nothing, twice. Oh, check it out. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Now I'm getting a strip, a quad polygon with 90 degree angles at the location of each one of these guys. And you can see how quickly I can go in and create a custom floor plan. Pretty cool, huh? So we're going to pretend that this is Pat's house. Looks nothing like my house. All right. So with wall mode on, you're able to create the outside dimensions of your wall. OK, hold on. Do you mind hitting a question first, and I'll help you. Create lines. Okay. Go into your pen. Oh, actually, it's working. You're just so far zoomed out that you're getting, getting the appearance of those lines. Go into pen mode. Let's just, or your pen options here. Yep, they're on polygons, wall modes on inner. Drop your tool for a second. Grab those verts down in there. Go to vertex selection set. Just grab those guys. Okay, now do Shift A. Hold on your middle mouse button and drag over that area. Drag out of selection box. There you go. Now do shift A. There we go. It's actually creating a wall. Yamani ran into something here that's worth pointing out. Now that we're working inside of the, now that we're working with a tool whose uh, parameters determine 
the thickness of our walls, our location inside of our three-dimensional viewport is a big, big factor. Yumani on her screen, she was clicking and she got this, this small indication. She just she thought she was just making straight lines, right? She wasn't. She had the wall mode on. She was actually making quad strips as you see here. But she was so far zoomed out inside of her three-dimensional scene that they looked like lines. But they're actually quad strips, okay? If you look closely inside the wall mode uh, choices here, we have some options that are really, really important, okay? This offset value determines the size of our walls, okay? Does anyone know what size this currently is? 10 inches. 10 inches, okay? This is 10 inches. We're working in real world units now, okay? We're working in a, a measurement system. Yeah. Go ahead, and then I'll get ready you. Can you go other measurements? Absolutely. And I think, uh, let's, uh, let's just talk about that for a second, Tyler. Because for some of you guys, it's probably not showing up as inches. It's probably showing up as millimeters right now or kilometers, or meters, okay? If you don't want to think in millimeters, let's change it. If you go to the top of the screen where it says Moto, Preferences, you're going to get our crazy global preferences, and in, where is it? It's down here, under the input section, there's a subcategory called Units. At the top of that list, here it is, the unit system. I have mine set to English, which allows me to do everything in feet and inches, okay? Um, I think I've also changed my default unit from feet to inches because I th often think in, in inches uh, before I think in feet. Uh, mine's different than yours. Mine's feet. Yeah, and that's fine. Whatever it works for you. Whatever works for you. You're going to find that the, the, the scale system inside of Moto is very flexible. I could type in 48 inches or I could type in 4 feet and it would give me the exact same measurement. So it's, a, it's a, actually it's the most intelligent unit of measurement system that I've seen in the 3D industry. You can actually do simple math in there. Like if you don't want to figure out the size of a wall, you know, I, I can go 48 inches divided by 8, eight point blah, 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 other inches and it will figure out precisely what that needs to be. It's great. It actually does simple math for you. Actually, complex math in all the channel editors. Uh, I was just going to ask what the standard wall thickness is. Standard wall thickness. I think it changes depending on, on if it's an exterior wall or an interior wall. I believe exterior walls, and I'm not a construction expert, so take this with a, with a grain of salt. I believe exterior walls are 10 inches, and interior walls are 6 inches. That's my, that's my understanding of it. Um, okay. And inside the unit system, you know, we have standard imperial, metric, game units, and unit list. My recommendation for the things that we're going to be doing in here, keep it on either metric or English. That's, that's going to be the path of least resistance going forward. Okay. So with the, with the understanding that our wall mode is actually using a real world dimension to determine the thickness of the wall, let's change this thick, thickness and see what the tool is going to do. While the tool is still live, we can change any number of one of these settings and it will immediately update inside of our OpenGL viewport. This I like. I like very much. Check it out. I'm going to change. No, I think I made the mistake and I dropped the tool while I was explaining. So let me uh, just draw a shape again real fast. Oops. There we go. Just something crazy. Okay, check it out. If I change my offset value, look what happens. The size of my walls change. Okay, and it's keeping the tangency to the location of uh, all of our control points. It's an intelligent tool. It really is. It, it's really going to uh, make our lives a whole lot easier. Now, the, the rule system that determines on which side of the control vertice it's going to grow my wall from is based on this wall mode. If I do outer, for example, look what happens. Now all the walls are being grown on the inside of my shape instead of the outside of my shape. Okay? So if I was to change the dimensions of my wall now, by modulating the offset channel, you can see what I'm getting. There isn't, there, there isn't a wrong way to work. It's just your way of working. Okay? Some people I know, some people think that the, you know, the control points that they place down represents the outside dimensions of the wall. So using the inner, or excuse me, using the outer channel here it would make sense. Other people, inner makes sense. There's also a, uh, a both, which is going to put that control vertice right smack dab in the center. Something like that. 
Now right now, if you look at the dimension that I have in my offset channel, uh, it's six inches. Now it's six inches to where? What is six inches? From both sides. So this is actually from there to there is three, and from there to there is three. So keep that in mind, okay? It's total diameter of, uh, of the wall. All right. I'm going to go back to inner. A little bit easier for me to see what's going on. All right. Now let's talk about uh, um, inset. We're not going to talk about inset. Well, I'll talk about inset only through the lens that the Nota does. Um, here's, he, he, let's, you can play around with inset just this one time. Okay? Don't ever do this in production. Okay? Don't, you don't ever want to do this. This is a bad, bad idea. Okay? okay? Doing inset, what it's going to do, it's going to round the corners. Okay? It's going to round the corners for all the, so if we do it, check it out. It should round the corners. There it is. I actually had the value too big. It was trying to round the corners uh, at uh, 473 feet. And each one of my walls is six inches, so the values just weren't, weren't working. Okay, so don't ever do this. This is, this is bad. This is very bad. This is all sorts of bad. And the reason why this is bad is that what you're creating here on a pure geometric kind of perfection level is something that's not good, okay? Because we've made it a whole series of triangles who's, who are all going to terminate at the same location. That's bad, 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 okay? I don't like this kind of flavor of modeling, although you can do it, okay? It's good to know it's there. Yeah, you certainly could go in and, and reconstruct it, and so it's not a you know it's, it's not a bad thing to have uh, happen because you could go in and select all those guys, go into edge mode and and remove them, okay, and then you can reconstruct that corner using quad polygons, okay. You always want to be looking to create everything in quad polygons initially, gives you the most flexibility going forward. All right, a um, couple other things. Let me just get rid of that. Go back and make a new one. Let's turn my offset value back down to zero. Okay. So forget about inset. Show. This is actually kind of neat. And another reason why working inside of Modo is, uh, is pretty fantastic is that we can ask the computer to go in and communicate a number of different parameters and little chunks of information for us, including the angles. Okay. This is great. <laughs> this is absolutely fantastic, especially when you're working with a defined angle in your plans, okay? So if your architect says that this angle here is precisely 120 degrees, you can go and ensure that it, that angle in here is also 120 degrees. Just bubbling to the surface all the information that the ArcViz guys and gals are going to need. Yeah, you know, um, not really. Don't, don't show numbers as something else. Show handles will just give you transform handles whenever you click on one of the control points. Some people like that. Uh, I'll turn those off. I'll turn show angles off because show numbers is it's a little deceiving. And if the lords of Luxology are listening, you need to make these numbers bigger for me because my eyes are getting bad. Okay? <laughs> these are horrible. It's basically assigning a number to the control points all, all along your curve. Okay? That's all it's doing. That's all it's doing. That, this is show numbers. Okay. Show numbers. I find this in its most current iteration useless. I don't think I've ever turned this on, and I don't know why you need to see a numeric next to you know next to your control point that defines the. the I just don't get it. I don't understand. But it, you know, it'd be the one thing I've learned about software development is that uh, things are are placed with an, an intention. Uh, I'm just not aware of what that intention is. Okay, the next thing that I want to show you is the snapping element, okay? Because we can work inside of a very, very neat snapping paradigm in Modo. We're going to continue, I'm going to introduce snapping, and we're going to continue to expand snapping over the next couple of weeks. Because the snapping idea, the paradigm of snapping inside of Modo is pretty intense. You can do some really neat things with snapping. However, for right now, what we're going to do is just enable snapping. The snapping system inside of Moto is a global system. So you turn it on and it affects every tool inside the application. Then we turn it off. 
There's a couple different ways that we can enable snapping. The keyboard shortcut is X, okay? It's not S, it's X, okay? If you hit the X button, you'll find that the other medium, or excuse me, the other method that to enable snapping kind of highlights. I'll hit X, check it out. Yeah, up at the top in your menu bar up here, this is a button, okay? This is, a, this is also a toggle, so hitting X, will toggle snapping on and off, or you can hit that button right there, and it will turn snapping on and off. In addition, if you go back to your tool options section of your toolbar, see it says down here snapping, snapping, there it is. Okay, well that gives you the palette. I guess it doesn't turn snapping on, but it, doesn't, it, gives, all, it gives you all of your snapping options, and we'll come back to those in a minute. We're, uh, I'm not gonna talk about those quite yet, but notice that once we enable snapping, all of the pen snap choices uh, become available to us. And these are really neat, because if you look very carefully at what we have here, we have world axis snap, okay? So it's gonna understand the orientation of the X, Y, Z axis. It's also gonna make straight line snaps, yeah, okay? And right angle snaps. I don't see that. Yeah, because you're not in the pen snap area. So I have my snapping system turned on. I hit the X key, and all this stuff is turned on. Now watch what happens, and you can even start to see it when I manipulate it here. Well, yeah, okay, check this out. And I, this is going to be kind of difficult to see with the lights in its current form. But this is how awesome Moto is. Look at my cursor. Watch, 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 watch. Oop, do you see it? It's kind of faint. You'll probably see it on your screen before you see it on mine. But they're actually starting to preview that little right angle indicator that you're used to doing in geometry class, that little square that you draw in the corners to, to denote that that's a right angle. That's automatically being drawn when we've placed that vertex at a right angle to one of another line. Let's see if I can get it again. There it is. See it? Oh. That little shadow, that little ghost there is telling me if I was to place my cursor on that purple dot, then it would snap to a right angle. So you kind of get a snap highlight now, which is kind of neat. Right angle. Also do straight line snaps. Whenever you see a purple cross show up, that means the snap system has been, that you're snapping to something, whether it be a right angle, a straight line, one of the world axes. It's pretty great. Okay. It's pretty great. And now I can just very quickly flush out what I'm looking to flush out here. Just get everything in straight lines, everything in 90 degree angles from each other. If you look in the, the top right hand corner of my, uh, of my wall, I'm getting that right angle indicator again. So they're going to come and go based on the location of all these verts. It's great. Yeah? So if you drop your tool, how do you reselect? You can't. Yeah. This is why you want to make sure that your layout, okay, your wall is perfect, perfect, perfect before you drop your tool. Um, the awesomeness of the, of the pen tool is only available to us while the pen tool is still active. So if I was to drop my tool right now, I'm now in a straight up, straight up polygonal editing mode. Okay, let me turn my snapping agent off. Okay, so now if I wanted to go and make changes to my mesh, I'm, I have to use my traditional editing tools. So be very careful. Be absolutely sure before you go one step further that you have your wall precisely where it needs to be. Okay, questions, other questions about working with the pen tool. All right, so the pen tool is a lot of fun. Uh, I think I'm just going to use the pen tool here to, um, to make a, a simple little floor plan for my house, okay? I want to turn on the snapping system because I absolutely want to have access to all of my world axis, straight line, and right angle snapping stuff. And I'm just going to start throwing down some control verts. And I want to make me a little house. Something like this. Yeah. Very cool. I like it. Drop the tool and I'm ready to go. Um, oh, I, this is something that uh, I th one of you guys asked me last week. How can we snap to the grid? You see the grid down there, but I want to snap to it. Well, let's take a look at it. It's actually not too bad. It's pretty easy to enable that. We have to turn on our global snapping engine, and then we have to go into our snapping options and say, hey, snap to grid. Let's just do it. I'm going to hit undo to get rid of all of this.
Okay, oops. There we go. So I got my global snapping system turned on. If I go down here and click on this snapping button, you're going to get a flyout menu that gives you a whole lot of options. And really, there's two sections in this that you want to look very carefully at. Start with the top section where it says snapping mode. And you can see all the different things that we can snap to. And there's a number of them, right? It's great because we can snap to the grids. We can snap to other pieces of geometry, which is awesome, OK? Uh, we can snap to polygons and edges. It's fantastic, OK? The snapping engine inside of, inside of Moto is best in class. It really, really is. Once you kind of get used to going into this little flyout menu, it becomes an invaluable asset, OK? So I'm going to go snap to grid. Once we choose which type of snapping mode we want to use, we're going to get some options down below. Okay? Don't worry about this constraint stuff. That's, that's really kind of advanced. But check it out. We can use a fixed grid. Uh, you know, we could do a 2D snap. 2D snaps will only allow you to snap within two-dimensional axes or two of our uh, axes inside of our three-dimensional scene. Um, don't worry about that for now. That's something that you'll understand once you get to, you know, once you get a little bit more custom working with snapping. Um, all right, so now that I got my grid on, there we go. So right now, it's going to snap to the grid that you see inside of my screen. See the little yellow cross? That's the snapping engine at play. And it's snapping to each one of these grid lines. Now, Modo has a defined. Let's do this. Oops, let me go back. Now, Moto has an interesting grid system that a lot of people kind of don't understand at its core. Okay, it's not exactly the most obvious um, thing when you're first learning. I'm snapping to the grid, but what happens if I zoom out? The grid changes sizes. We have a dynamic grid here. Okay, the grid squares are always going to tell us, or we're going to be told, the size of each one of our grid squares by that number right there. Okay. This can be a problem, especially when you're trying to snap to a consistent grid, which is why they had that option a moment ago of fixed grid. So if you always want to have a grid that's precisely five feet wide, you can turn that on pretty quickly. Let's go back in. Now, each one of my grid squares is six inches. Let's go back into my snapping tools. I'm going to use six grid or fixed grid, and I want to say, hey, it's going to be six inches, and I want to show that grid every time I click and snap. So if I was to make another house, that purple grid is my fixed grid. Very cool. Let's make the walls kind of straight. Last time I checked, that's probably a really good idea. If I snapped to the middle one of the squares, of one of those squares, the purple ones, uh, yeah, yes. So if you get your cursor, it's always going to go to the corners. So it'll snap to a corner, even though you, your cursor is in the middle of the, the square. Correct. Okay. You got it. Okay. You got it. Snap to the closest corner. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think bridge would work. Bridge is a great tool. I'm going to show you something here in a minute called Booleans that will help you to get a little bit more consistency for those interior walls. You're going to like Booleans. Yeah. The same problem again. Let's take a look. Imani's running into an interesting issue here. And I, and I, and I, and it's, it's kind of important in app to what we're talking about today. You might check this out. In the bottom right-hand corner of your OpenGL viewport, the computer's going to tell you how big each one of your grid squares are. How big are each one of your grid squares? It says 20 mi. 20 miles. Yeah. Yeah. You just zoomed out way too far. Here's what you... Here's what you want to do, okay? Drop everything in your scene. Drop all the selections that you have. Delete everything that you have, okay? Don't, okay, and don't use the scroll wheel. The scroll wheel is going to get you in trouble. Do shift A. Okay, now each grid square is six inches and you're centered around the origin of your scene. 
So now it's going to work. Other questions? Yeah. Keep your eye on this number as you're starting to work, OK? I'm always kind of zeroed in on how big something is. And, and you only kind of mess up on the scale you know, two or three times before you say, OK, I got to really pay attention to how big things are, OK? All right. OK, let's see here. Um, yeah, I'm going to drop the tool. And I'm going to get rid of this guy. And I'm going to turn. One of the things that I just kind of do out of habit is that I deactivate all of my snapping modes when I'm done. So I'm going to put it back to none, just to make sure that the computer doesn't get confused. And then I'm going to turn off snapping. Okay? Snapping is one of those things that you have to remember to turn it on and then to turn it off. Okay? I do believe you can temporarily enable snapping. No, I thought there was. I, th I thought there was a button. That, I thought you could just hold down X and it would only turn it on for a second. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay? Just make sure you turn it on and you turn it off. So these are going to be the the um, these are going to be the walls of my house. So let's give it some dimension. So I want to extrude it up, something like that. All right, rock and roll. Now our conversation today is revolving around scale and how we need to apply the correct measurements of our house on our three-dimensional model. How tall are these walls? Is there a method that, will, that we can use to very quickly determine how tall these walls are? Uh, change the camera view to front. OK. Change the camera view to front. And then what are we going to do, John? Uh, use the grid. Use the grid. You know, that's not a bad thought, right? Because you can use the grid. If, uh, if in its current form, each one of these things are six inches. So every two grid squares is a foot, right? So if we count it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We'll call it eight. So right now my walls are four feet high. I mean, that's a whole lot of work to count. I, I don't count. You know, I'm sitting in front of a computer. I would really, really like it if the computer counted for me. Okay? That's the whole idea of computer-aided design is that it helps me do the math because I'm an artist, not a math, mathematician. Okay? So let me show you a, a, a really cool tool. It's called the dimensions tool. And the, and the dimensions tool is going to allow uh, the computer to measure how big something is. With nothing selected in our scene, it's going to give us the total dimensions of our house. You can find the dimensions tools at the top of the screen under the view pull down menu. And it's right there, the dimensions tool. If I click on it, ta -da, now I'm getting some numbers here. And again, if the guys at Luxology are listening, please make these numbers bigger is I can't read that. So the total length of my house is 13 feet 0.95 inches. So 13 feet 1 inches for all extensive purposes. And if we look carefully, the height of our house, yeah, I was close. It's 3 feet, 3 feet almost 10 inches tall. OK? So almost 4 feet. So the dimensions tool, a great way for us to quickly figure out how tall something is or how wide something is. Okay? Now this is a live tool, so if I was to go in and select something else, check it out. It's giving me the dimensions of whatever is selected. Okay? So keep that in mind. This is an area that people often kind of stumble upon when using the dimensions tool, is that it works off of selections. Whatever is selected is going gonna, is gonna to be measured. Okay? I, wanna, I clearly don't want to have four foot tall walls. I want to grab all of those guys and then move them up. Oops, excuse me. Now, one other thing to, to point out, that when we're moving things around here, all of our transform boxes give us a real-world indication as to how far we're physically moving this. So if I wanted to move my, uh, if I wanted to make my walls 12 feet high, and right now they're, they're four, let's just call them four. OK? How far would I need to move it? What's, what's 12 minus 4 feet? <laughs> 8. Yeah, so I need, to move, I need to move my walls 8 feet up. Well, instead of going in and physically you know, using the manipulators, OK? And nothing says I, I can't do that. But what if I just went in and numerically did it? What if I said, hey, I want to move this thing 8 feet? 
hit return on her keyboard, and boom, check it out. Now, it's not a very big house. Yeah, it's teeny tiny. Now, my wall is 11 feet, 9.75 inches. This is okay, right? This is helpful, but what if you really want your feet, or what if your feet, what if you really want your walls to be exactly, and I mean exactly 12 feet tall? The move tool is going to give us, it's going to give us some, you know, some options here. But I like precision. Scale tool? Now, I like the way you're thinking. The transform tools are going to allow us to change the location of a number of different things. But it's not going to give us the precision that we need to specifically place certain, uh, certain components in certain areas of our three-dimensional scene. Let me introduce to you guys one of my all-time favorite tools. And I wish every 3D modeling app had this tool. It's called Set Position. And set position is going to take the selected component and physically place it somewhere. Check it out. I'm going to go grab all of these polygons up here. Now, I want these to be precisely 12 feet high from our ground plane. You can find set position in the vertex category of tools. And it's right there, set position, one of my favorite tools. I can't live without this tool because I'm a little bit OCD when it comes to modeling. I really am. I need to have things be in straight lines. Otherwise, my brain goes crazy. Okay. So set position allows me to get the accuracy that I need uh, for, for this type of work. So I'm going to turn it on, and you're going to get this groovy little popover. And now it's asking you, OK, what value do or what location along the y-axis do you want me to place all of these polygons? Okay? And I'm simply going to go in here and say, I want, to, I want all of these things to be at precisely 12 feet high inside of my, my three-dimensional scene. Let's hit OK. And they're going to move ever so slightly because they were almost there. But now I know beyond any reasonable doubt, check it out, look at it, that that wall is 12 feet high. Okay? Because I set the location of all of those polygons to be precisely at 12 feet along the y-axis. Once you start working inside this real-world system of scale and start using these measurement tools to help you build your objects, you're going to find that the accuracy of your models is going to skyrocket. Because it's no longer just kind of meh, it's no longer just kind of close. Now it's perfect. Okay? Now it's dead on accurate. Something that you could print, something that you could give to a contractor. You know, I could give my drawings here to a contractor and say, hey, print this. This is precise and accurate. Okay? Modo's real world unit system is on par with, the, you know, with, with all the CAD stuff. A lot of people think that you know, the entertainment packages like Maya and Lightwave and Moto don't have the, ca the capacity or the ability to do CAD engineering work. And I say, yeah, we can. I can be just as accurate with my measurements and my drawings as you can be with yours. Okay? Using the tools that I've outlined so far, we're going to get that accuracy. All right. Now, I've got a teeny tiny house. Um, yeah, it's not very big, so let's make it a little bit bigger. Let's move some stuff around here. Yep, that'll, that'll do. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. Nah, I'm being too fancy. I'm just going to make it wider. Something like that. There we go. And, I, and yes, I'm intentionally putting an angle in the front of my house. So there's my house. A little bit bigger. Not very, the inside isn't very big. Let's move it, let's move it back a little bit. There we go. Now it looks like a house. Okay. So here's where my front door is going to be. I want a window over here. I want some windows on that side. Let's talk about how we can create openings in our house. I want to turn off my dimensions tool because I don't need it for the time being. So this is the basic floor plan, okay? And now I need to go create some windows and some doors, okay? However, let's talk about practice here, technique. How can I very quickly create a whole series of windows and doors? Let's just focus our efforts on windows. How can I create some windows? You can model 
yeah, we need to have some openings first, right, for some windows. How am I going to create those? We're going to get to the booleans, but here's where a lot of people start. They think, well, what about loop slice? Loop slice is great because we're going to need two horizontal lines running around our house to define the top edge and the bottom edge of our window. That's cool. That's no problem. I can do that pretty quickly. So I can select two polygons that run around the outside of our house, mesh edit, loop slice. Just ensure that the count is on two and the mode's on symmetry. And now I can place and define very quickly the tops and bottoms of all of our windows. I can even move them up, something like that. Awesome. Great job. Great job, Pat. Woo! Okay. However, what's the big issue here going forward? We need a door, but let's focus on the windows. We're not done with windows yet, right? We need vertical lines, right? Now I need a whole bunch of vertical lines. How am I going to do that and ensure that the width of all of my windows are exactly the same? Head scratcher, isn't it? A little bit of a head scratcher. We can't. We can't. Not accurately, at least. Well, there are some ways that we can numerically go in and do it, but it certainly is a whole lot of effort. Okay. I need to be able to go in and define those vertical lines, and I need to have a consistent shape across the entirety of my house. Yeah. I got loop slice, but well, I'm going to delete it because it's not going to give us what we want. Okay. Well, I'm going to delete those two edge loops here momentarily. Okay. If you if you start looking at houses, buildings. There's a lot of repeating elements, okay? Why? Why would you imagine that all the windows are the exact same size? Uh, Custom windows are expensive. They're really expensive. If you, if you, uh, if, if, have any of you guys like redone your kitchen? Custom cabinets are crazy expensive. It costs more than a car getting custom cabinet work done for like a kitchen. It's crazy how much expense, how much money. It's just crazy expensive, right? Anything that requires custom, custom values is going to be incredibly expensive. So often, building, builders and architects and construction workers tend to use off-the-shelf parts as much as they can, or at least a window size or a door size that's consistent in size, okay? Makes it easier, makes it cheaper to in, uh, cheaper. Uh, it's easier to install, cheaper to purchase. It, it, it's also, from a design side, gives us a nice sense of symmetry and balance. If all the windows are the exact same size, we can balance off the design. If one window was taller than the others, it would look kind of funky, right? There's a lot of symmetry in nature, and there's definitely a lot of symmetry in, uh, in, in, in the designs that we have uh, for our, our buildings and our homes. Okay. So we want to be able to use that exact same concept here in the computer. I want to be able to make one window and then use that as a, you know, as a building block for all the other windows. Okay? What we're ultimately going to do here is that we're going to use one piece of geometry to affect another piece of geometry. This process is called Boolean, okay? where we have one cube physically uh, affect and transform another cube, or in our case, the walls of our house. Because what I want the computer to do is use the size, scale, and proportion of that original cutter shape to make a hole. Let's do it real fast. It's pretty easy. I want to get rid of those two loops that I created a moment ago. And now, on a new mesh item, and let's just name this, let's call this walls. On a new mesh item, you got to do this on a new mesh item. I want to turn off my grid so it's a little bit easier for you guys to see uh, with the lights off. Or is that more difficult? Can you guys see that? Yeah, it's kind of tough, so just bear with me. I'll, I'll zoom in on the corner so you guys can see what's going on. There we go. All right. So you got to do this on a new mesh item, okay? You have to have one mesh item that contains all the walls of your house, okay? And then we have to have another mesh item. I often call this second mesh item, I name it. I name it the cutter mesh because this is going to be the mesh that contains all of the geometry that's physically going to cut and make a hole in my walls, okay? If you start naming these things in your item list, this whole process becomes a lot easier, okay? So now that we have our, our structure and our item list established, let's make some geometry. I want to physically create a whole series of cubes that I'm going to use to slice my walls. And let's look at it from the side here. And I'm just looking at proportions. That's a, that's a big window, something like that. 
All right, so there's the basic shape of my window, but it needs to be a three-dimensional piece of geometry, okay? So there it is. There's my window. In every sense, what we're doing here is creating like a cookie cutter. Now, our cookie cutter, in order for it to work correctly, has to pass through the inside and outside of our walls. So it's got to completely penetrate through the surface that we're trying to cut in order for it to, to make the slice correctly. So if we look at our scene, here it is. You can see that that piece of geometry is just going all the way through on both sides of our, of our outside walls. All right, cool. So let's just do it real fast. Let's go through the process of using this one piece of geometry to cut a hole in our walls. Now, once you have the geometry created, we have to participate in a very, very specific selection order. Okay, and this is usually the area that people kind of you know get get off track a little bit. We have to have the cutter mesh in the background. How do we get the cutter mesh in the background? You got it, okay? We need to have our walls be the active item in our item list, and by definition, all unactive items in our, in our item list are in the background, okay? You'll see why my finger quotes and me emphasizing in the background is important, because the menu that we're about to jump into is gonna use that uh, to, to determine the slice. All right, so let's do it now. I got my walls selected, my cutter mesh is in the background. To fire off a Boolean, I'm going to go to the top of the screen where it says Geometry. And at the bottom of this pull-down list, we have all of our Boolean operators. And there's three of them, Axis Drill, Solid Drill, and Boolean. We're going to, we're going to look primarily on Solid Drill. I find this one to be the most useful for about 90% of the things that we're doing in here. We'll talk about the third one, Boolean, a little bit later. But solid drill gives us choices, and that's really what we're after. Because remember, we're just trying to cut a hole in our wall. Solid drill gives us the most options going forward. So let's select solid drill. There it is. You're going to get this little pop over. And now we've got to pick our solid drill operation. Mine set to stencil. Yep. So geometry, Boolean. And then I chose solid drill. So inside the popover, the next thing that we have to do is to choose our Boolean operation. Okay? Um, there's four of them inside the solid drill tool. There's core, tunnel, stencil, and slice. Uh, core and tunnel do very similar things, as does stencil and slice. Let's look at both of them so you have a point of comparison. Um, personally, I hang out in stencil and slice for almost everything that I do. But core and tunnel both have their role. I'm going to leave it out on core. And notice that the driver mesh, the mesh that's going to act as the cookie cutter, is labeled background. So it's going to look at all of the visible items in your scene that are unselected and use that to drive the cutting operation that's about to, that's about to go forward. And when I mean all items, it's going to look at everything. Okay? So if you have 200 items in your item list and they're all in the background, all 200 of those are going to cut your foreground mesh. So be careful, OK? Only have the meshes that you need to uh, have on before you do this, OK? So here we go. Driver mesh is background. Let's hit OK and see what we get. What happened? Did it flatten it? No, what happened? Did it work? Yes, it actually did work. It did, ex it did precisely what the computer was supposed to do. You got it. You got it. It did, when you do the core operation, it's like core in an apple, right? You grab it, you grab the core of the apple, and you rip out the core, and then you throw away the awesomeness of the apple, right? We're doing the exact same thing here. What's on the inside of our cookie cutter is the only thing that's going to uh, uh, remain in our scene. Everything else is automatically going to be deleted. Now, what do I want to have happen? Opposite. The opposite of this, which brings us to tunnel. Okay? Tunnel is going to give us the, the, the result that we want. I almost never use core because this is often not what I want. I'm going to go back one step by hitting undo. 
We'll, we'll return to that exact same menu, geometry, boolean, solid drill. However, this time, I'm going to change my operation from core to tunnel, and we'll hit OK. Ah, there it is. This is working a little bit more you know, like it, OK? Because now what we have here is an opening, an opening that precisely matches the location and the size of our cutter mesh, that little box. You got it. And Ray Yu's bringing out some really important information here. If you look very carefully, we can kind of see through the inside of our walls there. Okay? That's no good. We don't want that. Okay? So let me show you the third option. And this is actually my favorite because it won't. If I was to do a tunnel like I did here, let me turn off my cutter. Does anyone know how I could close that opening to get a little roll of polygons right around the windowsill? We could bridge it. Yeah, bridge is a great way of working here. So I could even go in and let's see if I can do them all at once. Sometimes you get lucky and you can do them all at once. Sometimes it does weird stuff. I got lucky and I did them all at once. And now I have a nice little windowsill. Don't worry about these little diagonal guys, okay? You're always going to get a diagonal edge um, somewhere inside of your mesh. They're op don't worry about it. We can go back in and remove those later, okay? It's not a showstopper. All right, so that's all well and good. However, check it out. Sometimes you get really weird results. And what if you have like 80 of these things that you're doing? Going in, selecting each window cell and bridging it at the exact same time, not fun, okay? So let me show you my favorite option, which is stencil and slice, okay? Because sometimes I don't necessarily want to have an opening. Maybe I'm just trying to trace the outline of, uh, of my cutter mesh. Stencil and slice are going to keep, those, keep that, that interior piece of geometry in my mesh. It's just going to slice it. Let's do it. Geometry, Boolean, solid drill. This time I'm going to change it to slice. And watch what happens. Did it, did it delete that geometry? No, it just sliced the mesh in the exact same location as that box, okay, that was in the background. What's not showing up? I'm sorry, say again? Is there a way for them both? Yeah, there is a way for them to both show up at the exact same time. Um, if you change your viewport properties, if you hit the O key and go into inactive meshes, and then the first choice in that layer is make inactive same as active. And now both of them will show up. I don't recommend this though. I really don't recommend it. Okay? You're going to find yourself getting confused very quickly as to which mesh item you're currently working on. We're still going to have to bridge, but what this gives, gives us is options. Because maybe I don't necessarily want to initially delete that opening. What if I wanted to have like a windowsill perfectly around my window before I have an opening? How do you make an edge between two How do you make an edge between two? You can use edge slice? Have like two you want to put an edge between them. Uh, oh, uh, you can't. Yeah, you got to bridge. You got to bridge those polygons okay. to get an edge. So when you do the 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 slice operation, you get options, okay? Because you know, I some days I don't necessarily need to have an opening initially. What you know? What if I went in and I just started beveling this out a little bit? I could bevel it out, okay? Then I could do a little shift click, bevel it in, shift click again to bevel it that way, and now I have a windowsill instantly, okay? The slice command gives me options. It gives me the most options out of all of them. And then, when I'm ready to have an opening, I can bridge it. And here's kind of a power user trick. You can use bridge with a, with, with a, with a number of different component selection types. Actually, I think they work with all of them. I have two polygons selected instead of eight edges, as I did the earlier uh, minute ago, and the bridge will work. Of course, it's going to make a liar out of me. Let's try that again.
and bridge will work. Why isn't it working? Well, it normally works. Let's put it that way. Sometimes it works. I guess it's just going to be a little punk today. That's OK. I'll just delete the opening and bridge it by hand. Thanks, Moto. There it is. That's what I'm after. OK. Very quick, very easy for me to put a window cell in. Yes, sir. I, I did, uh, geometry. Ah, ah, yeah, here's where you went wrong. You need to have your house selected. Your cutter, your cube needs to be in the background. Yeah, now run the Boolean. Oh, okay. And you're probably going to get an error. Let's see what happens. Uh, slice, slice, background, that's good. All right, did it do it? It did do it. No. No, 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 what? Turn off your cube mesh item. See how it sliced it? Okay. It didn't do the top because it, your cube didn't have a top polygon. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. but it worked. Okay, hold on a sec. Let's, I'll make my way around. If I wanted to get it record cut, where would I have to be? Let's see, where, where are you here? I kind of just made the bridge. Just yeah. Well, and I think where Yamani is at is a great illustration as to why slice is the better option. Instead of doing tunnel, because with slice, it's just going to basically make an outline of your box, of your cutter piece of geometry. Now, from this outline, we can do a number of different things, Imani, right? I can just grab those polygons. I can continue beveling them out. I can do a number of other things. We get choices when we use slice. I'd say eight out of 10 times, I'm using slice before I use tunnel, OK? Now, uh, Ann, what'd you had? Now, orbit around a little bit. Let's see where your, where your guy is. Keep going. Go to the top. Let's see, we need to see precisely where that, that cutter mesh is. Now, it's not doing anything because the cutter mesh isn't going through the wall. It needs to be through the wall. You're basically making like a cookie cutter. That cookie cutter has to go through our geometry in order for it to slice. So is this bad, what I did here? <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, because I just like beveled it back and then cut out Be that Bevel one. what back? Um, well, it's not there anymore because, yeah, see, uh, hang on. Yeah, so I just like moved. Hang on. Here we go. I see what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Um. It's not bad, but we're not gaining anything, yeah. right? Because we want to connect it to the inside wall, the opening on the inside of your wall, right? Yeah. Now, if you're just trying to get an opening, then uh, doing the bridge would be a good idea. But if you want to go and do more things before you do that bridge, then you'll definitely want to start beveling. And I made a little windowsill. So we should slice instead of Yep. Tunnel? Slice. Boom. It did it. See how it sliced your walls to match that geometry? Yeah. I think I still didn't get the correct slicing. Yeah, it did it. It did it. Oh, OK. And now what? Turn off your cube mesh item. And let's see the result of your work. Yeah, it sliced it. And I bet you if you look on the inside, you'll see that exact same shape as well. Yeah. Now it's not it's not a cube because on your on your cube, your cutter mesh. Yeah. Go ahead and turn it back on. Okay, and select that layer so we can see it smooth shaded. See how there's not an opening? Or there's not a top here? There's an opening. If you were to, okay. if, you were to if you were to fill it and then do the uh, the Boolean, you'd be a, a, a I, I, yeah, you know, cube. The, the, full, the wall sides of my cube, are they selected now? Well, we only want to fill that top piece, right? Right. right. Yeah. So if you select just that opening in maybe like edge mode, you can hit the P key. Select it first to define the opening. Select the, the opening here. Oops. Yeah, no, you, you, you go back into edge mode. Put your cursor on an edge, though. The there you go. Now double click. There you go. Hit the P key. Okay. 
There we go. Now we have a polygon on top. And if you were to do the Boolean now, you'd get a square. Okay. Instead of that U shape. Okay. Tam, what you got? Could you tell me how to do the bridges? Yeah, okay. So orbit around, we need to see both sides. Or you can delete that, that okay. polygon on the inside. Okay, polygon. Yeah, delete both of those. Delete what? Delete, delete the, the inside and the outside ones. Do me a favor, Tam. Hit Shift A. Shift A. Shift A. Shift A. Shift A. There you go. And now it's going to zoom in and center your viewport around the selection. Make it easier to, for you to work. Now delete them. Delete those polygons. Okay. Now you got some funkiness going on here. Delete that one too. There you go. Let's zoom around to the inside and let's double check what that geometry looks like before we do the bridge. Yeah, I wouldn't do that way. I'd orbit. Okay. Good. Okay. Now select the, both those openings in edge mode and fire off a bridge. Yeah. Do I do the bridge here or do I select? <laughs> ah, hit undo. Hit undo. We've, I think we've chosen the wrong command. Do it one more time. Keep going until you see the walls of your house. Here we go. Okay. okay. Let's run it again. Okay, so got the house. Got the house. Go to Boolean. Boolean. I think you chose the wrong Boolean tool. Solid drill. And then, see how it's on core? Yeah. We want either tunnel or slice. There we go. Good. And it did it. If you were to hide your cube, you'd see two perfect squares on the inside and outside of your wall. Good. That's it. When do I do the bridge? You can do it now. You can do it later. Do I have to select the, do I have to select the polygons? Yeah. Let's, let's just talk about this. Let's just talk about this together as a class because I think there's some confusion. Hold on. Two seconds. I see your hands raised, okay? I see it. Let me, let me, let me, let me speak, okay? <laughs> just want to make sure that you guys understand the idea of this slice mode, okay? Because there's some, I think there's some inherent confusion going on, and I want to make sure everyone's on top of this. Mal and Steve, you got this? Okay. Listen for a second. I might answer your questions, okay? The whole purpose of slice is to get an outline, okay? We're using the cube to slice the walls in the shape of that cube. That's all we're trying to do. Now, what do we gain in this process? More control. More control, okay? Now, if you desire to just make an opening, you could have done tunnel. You're good. But if you're trying to make, like, window sills or something else, or like an actual windows, this is going to give you the most options because now we can just select the polygons and start beveling them like I did earlier, okay? So you got to think about what the outcome is going to be before you fire off the tools, because if you're just clicking around, you're going to be destroying your mesh pretty quickly, okay? So if you're just trying to make an opening, do tunnel, then bridge. If you're trying to make like window sills or something more advanced, this is the best option because the slice is going to give you the ability to edit this geometry after the Boolean, okay? For example, you can just grab those polygons and I could bevel them out. Okay, creating this small in uh, small uh, illusion of a windowsill. Then I can keep beveling them, something like that. Okay, just gives me options. That's what I get when I use slice. It gives me the control to use my decision-making process to figure out what the next step is going to be. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hit hit undo. Hit undo. Let's get it get it back. Okay. Gotta hit a lot of undos. A lot of undos. Now what I would suggest that you do is bevel this polygon and the opposite polygon at the exact same time. That way the shape that you create is uniform on both sides. Then you can bridge them together and make an opening. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Allison, what you got? Yeah, no, that's good. Good job. I would do both sides. Yeah, if you do it on both sides, the shape is going to be consistent. 
The opening is going to be uniform across the entire opening. All the edges are going to be flat. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So I do both sides. Do you have a question again? No? OK. All right. I can't hear a single thing you're saying, and you got to speak up. The box in your what? Oh, just try doing another right-click selection. I think it's just a draw error. Right-click right and drag out another box. There it goes. All right. OK, so um, real quick, let's just talk about one of the big advantages of working with these Booleans. Because working with one window, awesome, cool, right? Because now we can very quickly make, uh, you know, we can cut holes in things, just like a cookie cutter, right? But where this really comes in is when, we can, is when we need to make a whole series of openings or a whole series of slices that are identical to each other. Because I want to have a whole bunch of windows on my house, but I want all of those windows to be the exact same size. And this is really where the power of Booleans come in. Because I can just duplicate this piece of geometry. OK. Let's just do this. Just move it out of the way, because I already have a window there. I can just use my straight up mesh duplication tools. Just do a little clone in action here. Something like that. I'll have a lot of windows. Maybe that's too many. There we go. Uh huh. And as long as they're all crossing over, I can, I can actually do all the windows in my house at the exact same time. As long as they cross through the walls, life is good. Got to leave room for a back door in there, so I'll put a back door over there. Aha. OK. Oops. Forgot to copy these. Copy, paste. I'll move them. There it is. And now I can do all the windows at the exact same time. I'll go back to my wall layer. I'll, I'll, this time I'll do a tunnel, because I'll just make openings. Solid drill. We'll change the operation to tunnel. Boom. We can turn off our cutter meshes, and now just bridge the gaps. OK? And now I know beyond any reasonable doubt that every single window in there is the exact same size. I missed that. Did you just clone all of them? I just cloned them. Yeah, just cloned them. Let's see, where do you got? Yeah, bridge it. Mm -hmm. Turn off continuous bridge. There it is. Uh, zoom in. Click, click. One more time. Okay, drop your tool and hit undo. Command Z, Command Z. Not Control Z. That's going to get you in trouble later on. Okay, let's select both those openings again and see what we get. Okay, good. Let's bridge it. Turn off. Can, yep, continuous bridge is off. Now click. Interesting. Let's do this. Hit undo. Okay, good. Now let's just do like these two down here. Let's just bring that up. Oops. Okay. I'm always fixing something. Now it may actually be bridging them. But the, the, the normal of that polygon may be reversed. Go down a little bit. Let's orbit down some. And let's see. Can you like, orbit this way? And oop, too far. Go back. Go down now. No, it's really not making it. OK. Hit undo a number of times. I want you to, we're going to expand. Aha. I think I know exactly what's going on here. It's actually doing it, but we have overlapping geometry sitting right on top of each other. The reason I know this, let's go back to your opening. I want you to select one of those edges. Yeah, it's actually selecting four edges. So there's four pieces of geometry sitting right on top of each other. Do a mesh cleanup, try again. I think you'll be all right. Deselect what you got. Then go geometry, mesh cleanup. Hit OK. Yeah, look, 32 vertices merged. Try your, try your uh, bridge now. It's probably some failed bridges. We didn't go back in time enough. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, Ray, what, what you got? Uh, when you do this, it creates weird geometry. 
These little angles, yeah. yeah. And it's so what it's trying to is. They make the, the, the light bounce off the house weird. That's the next step. Changing the normal. That's the next step. That's the next step. Now Ray Yu is, is uh, as always, ahead of me a little bit, and he's running into a problem that we need to fix. And I wish I could bring up your screen right now, Ray Yu, because I think yours is such a beautiful, beautiful illustration. But I can kind of see it on mine a little bit, OK? What we've constructed here are n-gons, right? And the computer is having a hard time figuring out how to shade these n-gons. Because right? right now, the, you know, the computer just wants to shade quad polygons and triangles. That's what it does the best. It's getting confused. It's a little bit difficult to see on this projector, but you can just slightly see it up here. You see at the top of my house, we're getting this really weird dark area in here. We're getting this light stretch. That's the computer not understanding how to draw this surface. So it's producing what's called a render error. That's all it is. It's a render error. Okay? It doesn't understand the direction that this thing is facing in. So we need to make some changes. Okay? We need to slice up our model into quad polygons. Okay? And this is a really easy process to do. It's not that bad. But it does require a little bit of effort and a little bit of labor. If you've been very careful, and if you've uh, maintained you know, kind of a consistent mesh all across, this should be pretty fast. We're going to use our slicing tools to very quickly go in and slice, <coughs> excuse me, uh, slice up all these walls vertically and horizontally to get what we want. Okay? It's going to go pretty fast, especially when we start utilizing the snapping system inside of Modo. Okay? Remember I mentioned that we're going to get back to snapping? Well, that time has come. Okay? We want to use the snapping engine to make the slicing operation go a whole lot faster. And here's one of those things that I wish someone would have shown me when I was in y'all's shoes. Okay? The slice command inside of Modo is awesome. It's probably, in my opinion, the most overlooked tool because people don't know how to wrangle it. If you remember correctly, the slice tool is like a laser. And it's going to slice your mesh wherever that laser beam goes. So if I look at the front here, you can find slice under mesh edit. It's right there. And if I click drag a line, if you see that that purple line represents the laser. And it's going to slice everything that's in that laser's path. And I mean everything. Okay. If I was to jump over into my perspective viewport, check it out. It's going all the way through my house. Okay. It's doing this side. And check it out. It's also doing that side right there. Okay. People don't like slice because of this feature. Because they think it's uncontrollable. Right, if you just wanted to make a slice between two vertices, there, uh, I think I saw you do that before. Pen slice. Okay. Mm, not edge slice. Edge slice. Pen slice, something different. Edge slice. Okay. However, let's talk about let's continue talking about the slice command because we're gonna get the exact same result, Leland, a whole lot faster. Because if you were to go in and do I'm gonna hit undo. If you were to go in and try to connect the dots down here at the bottom, okay, in order for me to slice this into quads, I'm using edge slice here. Okay, hold down shift. I gotta do this for the bottoms and the tops of every single one of my windows. Okay, I got like I got like 20 of these things I gotta do. No, no, I'm not gonna do that because that's a lot of work. However, if we use the slice command and maybe make some modifications to our system. We can do all of them at the exact same time, or all the bottom ones at the exact same time, then all the top ones at the exact same time. Check it out. It's pretty great. Now, the, the way that we wrangle the slice tool is by two things. First, by selection. Okay? All things in Moto revolve around a selection. Whatever selected is going to be edited, right? I only want to have the bottom portion, okay? I only want to ensure that these outside. I'll do the outside and the inside at the exact same time. But I don't want to have these polygons up here get sliced at all, right? So by selecting the geometry we want to work with, we ensure that the, com the computer is only going to edit that geometry. OK? Well, that's pretty cool. I'll do the inside ones too. So if I make a mistake, at least I know I'm not going to damage the top of my mesh. OK? All right, now I'm going to do this in an orthographic viewport. So I want to change my scene so that I can see some windows. Clearly, clearly see some windows. Now, remember what we did here earlier. Go back in your mind four or five steps. 
we used one window to make a hole, right? And I'm trying real hard to sneeze, or not to sneeze, so I apologize. I hate, my face always looks funny when I'm trying not to sneeze. We used the exact same cube to cut all the holes for all the windows, right? Well, that cube was in the exact same location along the y-axis, right? So we can take this one step further and use a little, you know, our power of reasoning here to kind of assume that the bottom edge on all the windows is in the exact same place, right? And it is, because I didn't move them up and down. I only moved them left and right and along the z-axis. Their y translation never happened. So they're in the exact same height in place in, inside of our house. So check it out. I can use that to my advantage now. I can slice all of those bottom window sills at the exact same time. It's actually pretty neat, okay? Here's what I want to do. I want to use my snapping system to help. Because I could go in right now, I can, I can run the slice tool and then just do something like that, right? And you can see what's happening. It, it is slicing the mesh, but what if I'm off? What if I'm off ever so slightly, okay? And last time I checked, that isn't a straight line and I want straight lines, okay? This is bad, pet no likey. This is not the accuracy that we desire, okay? However, if we pair our slice tool with the snapping engine, we do get the accuracy that we need. We'll be able to very quickly and very accurately place this snapping laser where we need it to be. So check it out. I'm gonna go back to my snapping engine, I'm gonna turn it on, and then I'm gonna open my snapping options. F11 on your keyboard or this button right here in your tool options. And I'm gonna simply turn on some vertex snapping. So I'm gonna change the snapping mode to vertex. And this is gonna allow me to snap the location of my slice command to an existing vertex. It's pretty cool. So let me turn on vertex snapping. And you, don't, and you really don't have to do anything else, just turn vertex snapping on. And let's do the slice. Go to my, there it is. I'll run the slice command. Now I'm gonna initially start my cursor right there. Okay, you see that it's, it's probably a little difficult to see on the projector but you may see on my screen a small yellow cube. Can you guys see that yellow cube? That's the snapping engine at play. It snapped to that corner vert on my mesh. Now I'm gonna drag right, and then, so you gotta have one of these blue crosses outside your mesh, and then check it out. See how it's snapping to all those verts? Well, once I get to that point, I'm just going to continue dragging. It's going to preserve its location inside of my scene. When I drop the tool, check it out. I've snapped and sliced all the bottoms together. Ta-da! Wonderful. And not only has it done the outside, it's also done the inside at the exact same time. Let's do it one more time. Yeah. When you try to snap. Ah, actually it is. See, if you click there, you did, did you see the little yellow cube? Yeah. That was a snapping engine. That was a snapping engine. It may be that it has nothing to snap to. Try putting your cursor, see how you got an edge there? Put your cursor right at the intersection of that edge. Yeah, see how it's trying to snap? That little yellow cube is a snapping engine. Now left click and drag to the right. Do me a favor, drop your tool. Let's try this again. And let's double check to make sure our, our action center is currently disabled. And it is, so you can click off of that menu. Let's fire off the slice tool one more time. So left click and drag to the right. Oop. I think maybe what's going on is that you're left clicking and letting go. Left click until you see left click and hold until you see that little cube, and then once you see the cube, drag to the right. Drop your tool and refire re it. So left click and hold, there you go, there it is, yeah. Drop your tool and refire the tool. There it is, good. Yep. All right. With that said, you know, where we are right now, I can do the exact same thing for the top, okay? Now, I already did a couple up here for the top, so I'm going to delete this. Whoops. 
Here's a great little suggestion, and this is something that I struggled with when I was first learning how to do 3D modeling for a while. Uh, I want to delete those and redo all that slicing. However, if I hit the backspace key, I get that. If I hit the delete key, I get that. Hmm. This is, someone showed this to me about six years ago, and I, I, I wanted to both give them a high five and punch them because I wish I had known this, okay? This is, this is a hidden feature inside of Modo. If you go to your edge tools, there's a command down here called remove, right? People often overlook remove because they think it's going to do the exact same thing as backspace, okay? However, if you were to hit remove, you get a popover that says keep vertices. If you leave that on, boop. The vertices are the vertices are going to stay where they are, okay? And you'll delete the edge segment that was being drawn in between them. I love that one. I use that one all the time. Cuz so I want to slice all of these guys in here at the exact same time. Okay. All right. All right. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. My snapping engine's on. I'm doing some uh, vertex snapping, rock and roll. And now I'm just going to fire off the slice command. And I'm going to left click and hold until I see a yellow cube, and then drag it to the right. And then I can grab that indicator and drag it to the right, or the left, excuse me. I've sliced the top. Wonderful. So we've done the tops and the bottoms at the exact same time. Now we're still not in the clear. We still have some work ahead of us, right? We still have to do all the vertical slicing. Yeah, I've got it to work. Let's we'll see, see what we can see. I'm trying this. And then click on the edge right here. And then it turns yellow right. Yep. And when I move it. Drop your tool. Let's, let's drop it and refire it again. Oh, it's trying to do it. It's trying to slice. Um, here's a suggestion, and this is something that's come from a lot of experience slicing. Go into an orthographic viewport to do all your slicing. Don't do it in perspective, okay? Success with the slice tool comes in the orthographic viewports. So you can hit the little pill box, or the pill-shaped button in, in the upper left-hand corner. This one where it says perspective, and then choose any of your orthographic viewports. Or you can use my method. Control spacebar will bring up your, your hot box, as it's called, your marking menu. Then you interactively choose, <coughs> excuse me, the menu. Yeah, just grab those blue crosses and you can change the, the end and starting point of your slice. Yeah. Unable to slice. Triple polygons when they're okay. That's a fun one. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, drop the tool for me. Let's see what it did. Do me a favor. Turn off your cutter mesh. And um, let's do this. You know, what I think Allison's running into here is something that I, that I personally do a lot when I'm slicing, is that I select just the polygons I want to slice. Allison on her screen, on her model, she's made little windowsills around her window, and I think that's getting in the way. So if you select just the walls and then do the slice, your problem, your problem will probably get resolved. I'm going to do that for uh, my walls. Check it out. Let's see here. Let's go to my right side. Now, I need to do some slicing vertically this way. So I'll, this is how fast it can be if you work quickly, OK? Um, how fast it, it can be if you work quickly doesn't make any sense. How fast it can be if you use the right technique and you use, use the right tool. So I'm going to turn on snapping, fire off a little slice action here, just drag up. Drag down. If you hold down the shift key after you're done, you can refire the, the slice tool. Now, unfortunately, mine's doing it on both sides. And I got lucky for this one. But maybe I want to just really focus my attention on all of these guys. So just got to be careful. Do the insides and the outsides and the tops and the bottoms at the exact same time. Yeah, there we go. And now I can just very quickly go through with my slicing command. Just drag up, drag down, 
hold down shift, click on an edge, drag up, drag down, hold down shift, click on a vert, drag up, drag down, hold down shift, drag up, drag down, drag up, drag down, shift, drag up, drag down, and mission accomplished. Okay, and it did the tops as well, perfect. Did the bottoms as well, perfect. Mission accomplished. Yeah. Still not doing it. Let's take a look. Let's click on this. Okay. Don't jump over in perspective. Let's see precisely what you're you're working with here. Why don't we okay, let's focus our energy on on one window and troubleshoot from there. Let's go in right here. Yeah, the outside, that outside corner. Let's focus all of our energy right there. Okay. And let's jump into an orthographic viewport where we can see that polygon very easily. There we go. Okay. Now let's run it. Okay. There we go. So it worked. Um, I think there may be just something else in your mesh that's kind of stopping it from doing it in a global fashion. So maybe just do like one wall at a time and work your way around the house. Or just do, like, just do the outside and then go back in and do the inside. Cloning. Well, you're, cl you're cloning the wrong thing, right? Well, what do I need to do? You need to clone the box that's a cookie cutter. Okay. Yeah. Not the window, unfortunately. That would be neat. Any other problems? I tell you what, let's take a break. I think now's a good time to take a break, okay? Short little 10 minute break, all right? So we're gonna talk about roofs. What's happening, Aaron?
All right, a couple more things I want to talk about this afternoon before I let you guys start working on your house, because I know this is going to take a lot of effort, um, so I want to give you some time to, to start working on it. So we're going to pretend that we're happy with the doors and walls, and we need to start looking at a roof, okay? Roofs are kind of important, all right? Now, there's a number of different approaches that you can have as far as the sequence goes. You can do the walls first. Well, you definitely don't want to do the walls first, but you can do the windows first after the walls, or so I guess that would be windows second. Or you can do the roof second. Either one works for me. They're going to employ the exact same technique either way. I'm sorry, neither do I. <laughs> it's like gray, white, gray, white. You turned Ray GL on. Clicked on that button. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so we need to get a roof on this thing. Okay. However, let me suggest a couple different ideas when placing a roof. Establish the roof line first, and then go back in and manage the walls. Okay. Because if we use this Boolean idea to heart, we can absolutely ensure that our walls perfectly match the pitch of our roof. So let's do that first. Let's do the pitch of the roof initially, and then we'll go back in. And make something that's a little bit more cool. Okay, so I want to look at my house from the front. There's my house. This is going to be the front door. Or, yeah, I'll put the front door over here, and this will, I don't know, be something. But let's make some, some roof. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to make my roof in a new mesh item. Now, what basic shape is a roof? Uh, cube. Yeah, it's a cube, right? It's a cube who's been bent a little bit, and we're getting that pitch. Let me show you some really great ideas on how we can establish how we can establish this pretty quickly. Okay? Now, a lot of folks, they would try to do something like this. And this is not a bad strategy to start with. They'll make a really long, really long uh, cube, skinny cube like this. And then maybe they'll slice it along the x axis to get the extra segment. Okay? There it is. We have our middle point. Okay? The middle point of the roof is really important as it establishes the roof line. Now, one cautionary tale here. Because this, this in itself is not a bad idea, right? It's not a bad idea at all. However, got a little bit of an issue here, okay? If I was to simply grab that middle line and move it up, it looks as though it's all right. But if you fundamentally look at the distance between that edge and that edge at the top of the roof line, it's of a much different edge or a much different dimension down here at the bottom. Maybe this is eas more easily illustrated if my roof was a little bit initially thicker. Here we go. So if I move this up, see how it kind of pinches up here at the top? This distance right in here is different than that distance down there. It's going to distort and pinch if you were just to pull it up in the center. So be aware of that, okay? Be aware of that. Let me suggest something else, okay? Because we can use everything that, everything that we've talked about today to heart. A couple other things we got to look at is the realism that we're creating here. With this kind of roof, look at the way the roof line is ending. Is that the way it actually looks? If you were to go out to your house and look at the way the eaves are, are structured at the edge of your roof, is that what it's going to look like? No. We're going to get back to that. We're going to get back to that. My suggestion is to make the profile first, okay? Because there's some, there's some elements in here that we need to define. The edge of our roof is not going to look like that. It's not going to be sliced vertically. It's going to be 90 degrees to the angle of the roof, right? Well, I don't know what that angle is. And I certainly don't want to try to have to measure and figure it out. However, I do know that when I create a cube, the corners are going to be perfectly 90 degrees. What if initially I rotated the cube okay, to establish the pitch of the roof? Let me show you what I'm talking about. So instead of doing this, okay, and I'm going to make this much thinner so it actually kind of looks like a roof, okay. I'm going to do this, okay. So this this polygon right here is going to define one half of my roof, okay. And I'm going to rotate it. I'm going to rotate it where it needs to go. So I'm going to establish what's going to be the roof line of my house, and I can get pretty accurate here and put it right smack dab on the outside of that wall. Okay, rock and roll. Now, uh, I have some issues here in that it's not big enough. It's definitely not big enough. 
this is this uh, that edge is supposed to be the roof line that you know of our of our house. Okay, it needs to be in the dead center of our house. Well, I don't know where the dead center is, but I certainly don't, and I and I certainly know that it's not in the middle enough. So I need to make some transformations to that edge. If I change my action center to selection, and then simply move it, I'll be able to preserve the angle. And I'm going to overshoot it by some distance. And I can do the same thing down here because that's. That's a huge eave. No one, no one's eaves hang out that far outside of your roof. You know, that's, no. Something like that. There we go. I like that. All right. Let's turn my grid on and see where we, where we are in relationship to the origin of the scene. Now, I've done a very bad thing here. Let's uh, put my walls. I'm going to center this along the x-axis. There we go. You want to use, you want to use this, uh, use the, the origin of your scene as much as you can. Uh, to establish the location of all these pieces because we can use a number of different things. We can use that grid slicing system that we were talking about earlier because I still, and that is a massive, massive pitch. It's way too big. Sorry. Now I'm like getting all nitpicky here, but that's okay. All right. We still need to capture a vertical line in the center of our roof, okay? We've established the angle of our roof, the, put, the pitch, but now we need to start looking at how we can create the other side of our roof, okay? So we need to have that ridge line, that roof line going down, going down the dead center, okay? Now we can use our snapping system that we were working with earlier to get what we want, right? Because I can turn snapping on, can go into my snapping options. I'm not going to do a geometry snap, I'm going to do grid snap. And uh, just fire off the slice command. Boom. Check it out. Perfect. Because what we're after is a perfectly vertical line in the center. Okay? That's what we're after. We're after that ridge line. Yes, ma'am. I'm um, just center selected. That's all I did. Now that's looking exactly how I want it to look. Okay? Because we're getting the angle down here in the eaves, that's, that's accurate. That angle, that angle right there is perfectly 90 degrees to the slope of the roof. Perfect. That's the detail that we need. Looks a little bit too big at the moment. Let's turn snapping off. There we go. But I only got one side. Let's make the other side. What command will allow me to duplicate geometry across an axis? Do you guys remember? Mirror. That's right. So if we go to duplicate, we can fire off the mirror tool. The ridge line of my roof is perfectly centered around the, uh, the middle of the x-axis. So if I change my action center to origin, it's going to make an exact copy on the opposite side of the x-axis. Action center, origin, click on the other side, perfect. And it looks like my grid snap is still on. Let me turn it off. There it is. And now I have a perfect ridge, a perfect roof, okay? Okay, um, and let's uh, now ray you, I'm going to extrude it because what I have here is just a two-dimensional profile of my roof. Well, if I just run the extrude command, shift X, just bring it back along the X axis here. These front ones need to be moved out some. There we go. Da da, and we're getting there, and we're getting there. Okay. So there's our roof. Let's, let's rename this roof. All right. However, we have a little bit of a a little bit of a problem, don't we? What is my problem? Yeah, Tyler, hit me. Just a cube. Let's do the entire thing once more. Okay, just a cube. Long skinny cube, okay, and then I just rotated that cube to establish the, the pitch of my roof, something like that. Once I have the pitch of my roof established, I need to slice it, okay, I need to slice it to match the center of my house, right, because we need to have a ridge line. All roofs, you know, terminate at a ridge line, right, that ridge line is going to be in the center of the structure, okay. If we used our snapping system, and specifically our grid snapping system, I can just slice it. Shift C, 
slice it. Now I know that beyond any reasonable doubt that I am perfectly on the center of the x-axis, and I can just delete the opposite side. And then mirror it across. Let's just mirror it. Duplicate, mirror, action center set to origin. There it is. And I'll just extrude it back to create the shape. Yeah, I extruded it. Extruded it. Yeah. Yeah. You trying to make what small? It's way too big. Yeah, go into your, uh, have you centered your, your object around the origin? So all of it? All of it. The house is, everything's centered around the origin of the scene. Okay. Yep, hit shift A, it just popped down to the origin. Shift, no, shift A. You don't want to undo it. Yeah, there we go. Now, hit, hit undo, actually, because there's one thing that we want to do. We don't want to be sitting under the floor. Do center selected. So once more. That works. Center selected. This time, don't do all. Just do ZX down there. Boom. Good. Now you can start working. So we need to get a center line, a ridge line for our house, right? Yeah. Jump over into the front orthographic viewport. Front. Okay, cool. So here's the center of the x-axis. Looks like your house is roughly centered. Mm -hmm. So if we turn snapping on, and let's go enable a little grid snap. Right here or yep, yep, in the inner in snapping tool po uh, two properties. One that one right there, okay. so the snapping options. And let's do grid. Now, when we run like the slice command, no. yep, it's going to snap to the grid, right? Well, uh, we wanted to go vertical, right? Grab, uh, grab one of these crosses, bring in, yep, there it is. Grab the other one, right, because of the laser. Bring it, we want to cut right there. Okay, drop the tool, try again. You, just click, no, le left click and drag down. Drop the tool, try again. Try one more time, here we go, you got it, you'll get it. Just left click and drag, there it is. Keep going, keep going, keep going, stop. Because now the purple line has intersected our roof line. So it's sliced just that area, right? Sorry. Drop tool. Ba boom. Now, it's hard to see because it's right on the exact same axis line as the x axis, but there's, a, there's an edge there. We can just delete the other half. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where to go from here. You're, you're in the exact same place Yamani was. If we use our grid snapping, is that on right now? Yeah, grid snaps on. Fire off your slice command. Now, just left click and drag down on the center of the x-axis. Yeah, because all we're trying to do is, is just get rid of that extra bit. That's good. Perfect. Mission accomplished. Yep, yep. If you look very carefully, see how it sliced it? We don't want the other half, right? You can just delete it. Make sure you're deleting all of it. Yeah. Ivan, what's up? Okay, let's see what you got. Mirror, action center, origin. Yeah, it's it's doing what it's doing, but if you notice very carefully here, there's a you know that edge is not precisely at the center of the x-axis, and that's why you're getting that gap. So I have to hit undo a couple steps. Go back in time. Okay, oop, that's that's great. With that edge selected, why don't you just do center selected on x? Bam. Oh. Now it'll work. Oh, yeah. Is there a way to make this slanted to... Uh, to make it fit within the wall? Like, because it's not like a square. It's not with the... Well, yeah. It'd be... It'd be yes. Um, it's much more difficult to do it now that we have windows and after the, you know, the pen tool's done. Yeah. I, I, this is, that's one of those things where I, I would be like... It'd be faster just to redraw the profile of your house than to, to edit the current mesh. 
Yeah, what you got, guys? Edge remove. Yeah. Yeah. When I. Let's see. I tried to remove those. Uh huh. You're gonna hate me. Cause you're going vertex remove. Oh, okay. So it's on edge. Edge. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that explains it. Okay. And then I hit that. Yep. Boom. Oh, all right, buddy. Yeah. So it did what it's supposed to do, but is that what you were trying to do? No. Okay. What are, what were you trying to do just then? I was just trying to get rid of some of the edges, but but it creates more problems. What edges are you trying to get rid of? Yeah, just the extras. But I guess that's fine just how it is. That's the yeah. That's that's fine, I think. Oh yeah. I'll just leave it. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is this passable on the roof? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. For sure. Yeah, for sure. It's kind of a boring roof, yeah. but it's a roof nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, Monty, then I'll help Randall. What you got? Looks what? Looks like way off. This one is kind of close to it. Okay. Um, zip over to like your top orthographic viewport. Okay, so it's straight. Now, it could be a number of different things. Um, yeah, you know, I think in this case, go back to your go back to your perspective, and let's grab like the polygon that's right here on the underside, the, the cap, if you will, of your, of your no 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 the, the one that's right there. Yeah, grab that one, and then just change your action center to selection. No 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 yeah. There we go, and just move it. Had that. Oops, oops, oops. Then selected. Nothing selected. There you go. Yep, you got it. See how the action handles are complete now? Yes, good. Yep. Very good. Now, no, 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 no. Uh uh. Hit undo. Okay, change your perspective so that you can see more of the front of the house. There you go. So we just want to. Have it sneak up that way. Oh, I see what's going on here. Interesting. Your house is not symmetrical. That's yeah, that's another not, reason yeah, why. Yeah. Really how I did that. Yeah. Okay. So there, there's options here. Um, you could leave it as is and then just move the walls so they match. Okay. Yep. Get options. Yeah. Yep. You know, like I had two million faces. Mm -hmm. And it was just a question. And I wanted to, to duplicate it. Each time I duplicate it, it's going to duplicate. You know, it's going to multiply the yeah. geometry. And notice each one of these have everything that's in here has instance. Instance, yeah. So if I use an instance, that just means it will be an instance of it. I can't edit the instance or anything, but I can just. The instances make a relationship to the, to the master mesh. So if you if you edit the master mesh, It'll all the instances will update. Yeah. So and that would save me memory. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Replicators is a little bit different. Um, replicators, um, yeah. Rep with an instance, you still get to move, rotate, and scale that instance in item mode after the fact. So you get a lot of control over where the placement of those. Like let's say you're trying to instance a whole series of buildings. Um, you get a whole lot of control with an instance as to where the thing's going to go. You can animate an instance. It's an item, so you get all the benefits of working it on an item. When you go into a replica, a replica is, um, it's, it, it is, it's a copy of the master, but it's going to be placed at the location of a point. And you can't change really a whole lot with it. So instance is probably a little bit more control. You get a lot more control with an instance um, after the fact. Replicas are great. I love replicas. They've changed my workflow, but you want to. It's it's they're like crazy advanced, and, and it's a Moto specific thing, so you can't take it out of Moto. It's always going to be in Moto. Um, but you're. The, um, instances. I mean, is there any reason I should use it rather than just flowing in there? Yeah, memory, memory, yeah, sure. yeah. It memory. It does help on memory. 
Yeah, it saves a little bit of memory. Yeah. Yeah. Instance, and then if you update the master, all the instances will automatically update at the exact same time. Yeah, it's a great way of working. Yeah, yeah. show. Faux show. All right, let's keep cruising because there's a couple things I want to talk about before we break for today, okay? Because um, I have a little bit of an issue with my house, right? What is the big issue with my house? Yeah, there's a gigantic opening in my house, right? This would be great during the summer months, natural air conditioning, but during the winter months when it's cold, mm, not so good, okay? So let's talk strategy on, on what we can do with our walls to manipulate them to move at the, uh, to match the pitch of the roof. Now, a lot of you guys are probably saying, well, Pat, I'll just go in here and I'll just, I'll just grab those top polygons like that and I'll move them up. Now, wait a minute. Hmm, not so good. Okay, uh, well, maybe, what if I draw a center line? Yeah, that's an idea. I'll draw, I'll turn on grid snap. I'll uh, turn on my grid snapping here. Do -do. Fire off a little shift C action. Okay, a little grid snap. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. And then I can, like I did with the, with the ridge line, I could just move it up like that. Oh, wait. Hmm. That's not really working. Yeah. The more complex the roof line of your house, the more problems you're going to get the walls moving up to match the ridge line. However, if we think a little bit outside the box and maybe use this idea of slicing, Boolean slicing to our advantage, we can create the, the walls of our house to match the, uh, the angle and pitch of our roof perfectly in a couple clicks. Let me show you what I'm talking about. And this is a great, great, great method. I've been doing this for years and it works just perfectly. So here we go. I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab all those polygons in there. Okay, just those top ones. And I wanna move them up. Okay. Oops. Move them up. Yeah, and if it gets really weird in here, that's okay. And that's fine. Okay. We want it to go actually further past you know the top of our roof because we're gonna use a boolean to help us out here okay and i'm gonna delete some of those diagonal guys just to get it out of the way let's check it out and oh actually my roof needs to be extended a little bit this way doesn't actually cover the entirety of my house there we go got a nice little porch in the back a nice little overhang in the front move it up you could bevel it you could bevel it. That's, not, that's no biggie. I'm moving mine up. Because what we're trying to do with the walls here is that we want them to pass through the pattern, if you will, of our roof. Because, uh, and this is why I, I suggested that you put your roof on a separate, separate mesh item, is that now I could simply go in and do a Boolean and slice my walls to perfectly match the pitch of my roof. Yeah, because so I can go geometry, Boolean, and I'm just going to do slice here. Ta da! Turn off my roof. Check it out. Now I have an exact pattern of where my roof's going to be. It would have taken me some time to figure this out manually. But using Booleans, I can just grab all those quickly. And I'm just going to delete them. I don't need them now. I don't need these extra polygons. Booleans are great. Okay, oops, didn't select the inside, my bad. Got to select the inside ones and the outside ones. Booleans are great, but just be very, very careful with them, okay? Got to make sure that your geometry is crossing. Got to make sure that everything's lined up. There we go. There it is. Oops, forgot a strip here at the top. And now, if I turn both on, da da, everything matches. It's a perfect pitch. It's perfect closure. I do solid drill. I do solid drill, and then inside that popover, my favorite slice. Slice, 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 slice. There it is. There it is. Very, very simply created object. Okay. Now, um, we could, yeah, go ahead. 
balcony. Yeah. Um, the cool thing about working with Booleans is that we can use basic simple shapes to continue to edit our roof if we need to. Let's take this one step further. What if we wanted to have two different roof lines going in alternating directions? You see that a lot in homes, right? Um, for example, what if we wanted to have, uh, I'm going to duplicate this mesh item. Whoops. Let's duplicate it. And on roof two, I'm just going to rotate it 90 degrees. Something like that. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, clearly I don't want to have this back half of my roof hanging on the inside of my house, right? And I don't necessarily know the angle of my roof. Well, we can continue using Booleans to slice up all of our objects, right? Uh, let's go back to, to roof numero uno here. Or, excuse me, roof number two. And I want to use roof number one as the slicer. I'm going to turn off my walls because I want to make sure it doesn't accidentally get sliced. So the boolean, solid drill, slice, there it is, good, 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 good. Now, all of this stuff is trash, I don't need it anymore. And I'm left with just the pattern that perfectly matches my house. Think cookie cutters when you're doing this. We're just making gigantic cookie cutters. If I turn both of them on at the exact same time, they match up quite nicely. Of course, there's nothing that says you can't go back in and do the exact same thing for this roof in here, right? If I wanted to get this angle, this roof, to not include this center section, let's, uh, let's think a little existentially now on how we could accomplish this, okay? Because I need to use the, the pattern here on roof two to slice to slice my guy. However, we have a little bit of an issue in that uh, um, none of this geometry crosses. It's got a cross. So here's an old school trick that I've done a number of times. It's a great tool in your edge command called edge extend. I think we've talked about edge extend before. The edge extend command is kind of like the bevel tool, but just for edges. Okay, It's going to create a new row of edges from the initial selection. So we'll just fire off edge extend. We'll left click once in the viewport, move it out along the x axis. And all I'm trying to do here is just get the geometry to cross. And I'm going to move this one significantly away over there. Now I can use that new geometry to slice this inside roof. And I'm going to filter my selection here, or filter my, my Boolean to only do this side. I don't want it to slice that side. Did it do it? It did not do it. Why didn't it do it? Okay, let's figure out why didn't it do it. Does it cross? Yes, it does cross. Ah, the reason it didn't do it, and this is, this is kind of funky, um, sometimes your Booleans don't work because the geometry is not closed. Okay, see how the geometry here is open? That can cause problems. The computer doesn't, doesn't know how to solve that shape, an open shape. So let's just do this. I'm going to, I'm simply just going to go in and just bridge some of these real fast. Close the shape. And it flipped the polygon for me. Or you know what you could have done? This would be going back in time a couple steps, but it still would have worked. You could have made a duplicate of your original the original house, but I'll just do this. There we go. So there's roof number one. Roof number two is in the background. Yep, that'll that should do it now. Did it do it? It did. Yay! And now I got to go in and delete some stuff. Ah, it failed over here, so let's just manually connect the dots.
Here we go. Now everything should match up. Of course, I'm going to get rid of all this stuff over here. We don't need these guys. Backspace to get rid of those edges. Same with the, their counterparts on the inside. Certainly wouldn't kill it to have it in there, but since we can delete it easily, we're on our way. Now, roof two, we have a small edit that we need to make on roof two. Just delete the, uh, the section that I, that I edge extended out. And there it is, the perfect roof. So you're using roofs, two different roofs, and we're using both of those roofs as the slicers for each one of these, those roofs, okay? Just think cookie cutters, okay? That's all we're doing. We're using one piece of geometry to slice another piece of geometry, okay? I didn't measure a single thing. Didn't figure out the angles, didn't have to, because the geometry and just the visual appearance of all the geometry leads me towards that result. So John, to, to piggyback and to, to further answer your question, if you wanted to have a balcony, if you wanted to have a hole cut in your roof, okay? Let's say I wanted to have a, uh, a balcony like over, over here. Well, on a new mesh item, just create your cutter, right? Maybe that's, maybe that's the shape that I want, okay? If that's the hole. Just make sure that shape is crossing through your roof. Now, let's see, what roof is that? That's that one. There we go. Now we just run the Boolean. And this time, maybe I'll do, let's do tunnel. Yeah, saves me some effort in there. And now we've chopped off a corner. We just got to close it with a bridge. Now we've chopped off something that we can use for a balcony, a deck, you know, whatever. Booleans are great because they just allow us to slice things with a little bit more accuracy. I love booleans. It isn't closed, yeah. So your geometry's got to be closed, okay? So you have to have, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be quad polygons, but there can't be any openings in your geometry, okay? So you can't have something like that in your cutter piece. Yeah, your cutters have got to be closed. Randall and then, and then John. Yeah? Um, this might be kind of silly, but can you use any shape, like no matter how much, like a cylinder? Any shape. Let me, let me show you. Let me show you. Maybe we have a teapot. And maybe, just maybe, and I have no idea if this is going to work. This is probably not going to work, but we'll see. Maybe. If we're lucky, okay. Oh, I'm on the wrong side of the house. That's not going to work. Let's put it. Uh, hmm. Let's just see if that works. I, that's this is going to be crazy. So where's my roof? There's my roof. My slicer mesh. Ooh, let's uh, fix that. My slicer mesh is in the background. Let's just see what we get. Did it work? It did not work. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Let's just experiment around with some stuff here. Yeah, let's just unsubdivide it. See what we get. That may have been the issue. Not yet. Hold on a sec. I don't know why this is not working at the moment. Roof is not closed. Oh, well, that there it is. That's why. My roof's not closed. Um, okay, just for... 
illustration. Well, here's your problem. Now I'm like hell bent on uh, trying to get this to work. Yeah, sometimes it can be a journey to figure out what areas is not not allowing you to close it. Okay. Now let's give it a go. Did it go? No, didn't go. Let's try something else. Let's try doing stencil instead of slice. Yeah. And maybe the teapot's open. Yeah. There's a very good chance that it is. You know, let's do this. And I think this is something that they actually just changed in the most recent version of Moto. You used to be able to have everything be open, and it was great. Now they want everything to be kind of closed. Yeah, I really liked it the old way. There it goes. Yeah. So as long as the geometry is closed. I got a teapot. I want to have, have a teapot skylight in my house. Why? Because I can. A teapot skylight with only half of my roof line. Awesome. Anyway. Huh? It's chic, right? It's modern. It's modern. I like to throw in a little graphics here and there, you know? Something new. Huh? <laughs> You're getting abducted, yeah. Yeah? So, so if you were to just say, you know, you had a, a square and you cut a cylinder, you know, a circle inside of it, uh -huh. where I need to uh, fix the end on it, slice it up, or put it in the finger? You know? Yes. The answer to the question is yes. Yeah. Yeah, you, at, the, at the end of the day, you always, always, always want to have, you always want to make sure you have, um, quad polygons, okay? So if you were to go in and do something like this, okay? Da-da. And there's my roof. Let's do tunnel, okay? You still have an end gone up here that you gotta fix, okay? Yeah, you still got end guns up here that you gotta you gotta deal with. Yeah, you always want to make sure you resolve that. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between highlighting edges and switching the key instead of uh, When you highlight your edge and you hit the P key, it's gonna take that selection and fill it with a with a polygon. Okay. So. Bridge is when you're connecting two different edges together. Okay. So I got that selection there. Hit the P key, it fills it with a polygon. Okay. It didn't do anything down there though. Okay, we didn't make a shaft. I want, if I want to make a shaft going between those two pieces, I got that one selected. I got that one selected. And then I run bridge, it's gonna connect those two edge loops together. Uh no, it won't fill it in. Yeah. If you wanted to fill it in and just get back to a cube. Hit P. And then delete it. Do what again? Um, in that particular situation, Anne's got something that's, that's kind of like this. And there's, a, there's some rules. That, well, there's, there's a couple things that, that I would suggest, make a suggestion to Anne, okay? Because this is what she has. She has something like this, okay? And something like that, okay? But just pretend for a second that it's, yeah, something very similar to that. Now, you have, this is a problem. This is a big problem, actually, okay? Because um, you could, you know, a lot of folks, they think, oh, I'll just bridge it. Yeah, and then you get a flat thing, which isn't good, okay? That's not good. Um, so you really, you have two ways of going forward, okay? Sp what I would look to do would be to move it 
with an action center of selection to something like that. Okay. Overextend it, and then you can slice it right down the center. Oops. Oops. You can slice it like that. Okay. Once you have it sliced, you can then mirror it across the x-axis. Okay. You want to make sure that that ridge line is dead set on the center of your x-axis. That way you can use those mirroring commands. Okay, so grab those inside polygons. <clears throat> Very little in the interface is right click, so. Okay, grab, grab some polygons. Those are edges. We want polygons. There we go. Now select, select the polygons in the, the trough, if you will, of that channel. And it's, it's like just one of them, not the entire thing. Yeah, now zoom in, get, get all up in there. Okay, now fire off the move tool. Move tool. Okay, now change your action. Don't, 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 don't hit anything yet. Change your action center to selection. There you go. See how the tool handles change? Mm -hmm. Orbit around a little bit until you can see which tool handle matches the slope, the angle of that polygon. Which color do you think it is? The blue one, yeah. Yep, go the other direction. Other direction. There we go. Okay, because now we've overshot our target, which is perfect, because we can go back in now and slice it to get a perfect vertical line. Okay. And then we can copy and paste it. Mirror it across that axis. <clears throat> okay, um, I want to show you something here that's really kind of fun. And I'm showing this not to make you go crazy, but I want to show you a lot of the technology that's out there in the market. Booleans are changing, okay? The Boolean industry is growing by leaps and bounds because, as you can see, cutting the holes in things is awesome, right? We like being able to add and cut things together and very quickly create a whole series of interconnected pieces, especially with if we're trying to print stuff. Well, with the current set of tools, doing Boolean operations gives us some really neat results, but what it doesn't give us is reverse compatibility. What if we wanted to go back and, and change something that we'd already done? What if we wanted to change the shape of our windows after we'd Boolean? What if we wanted to make a door bigger? Or what if we wanted to change the angle of our roof? Going back in time when using a lot of Booleans is often very, very difficult. Okay? The guys in the traditional CAD industry have some really great tools that allow us to non-destructively Boolean our models. And that technology has finally made its way over into the entertainment world through a plugin called Mesh Fusion. And I'm a big, big fan of Mesh Fusion. I've been using it for a couple months now. It, uh, um, I was very happy to get a, uh, I'm a beta tester for Luxology, so I get access to, to a lot of their stuff before it comes out. And I've been playing around with it for the last couple months. It was just released, I think, last week or the week before, and it's awesome. Um, I don't advertise too many plugins, because um, I'm a big believer in core tool set. And I believe the core tool set should, should serve us uh, on everything that we need to do. Mesh Fusion changes the game on a lot of different levels. And I want to show you this just so you get an idea. We're trying to get a couple licenses of Mesh Fusion here on campus. You have to buy it, and it's not inexpensively, unfortunately, but it's really kind of neat. So let's do this. Uh, I'm going to go into my Mesh Fusion area. And I got all these lovely presets here. Let's just do this. What if, what if I wanted to, let's do, let's have some fun here. Let's grab a simple little cube, okay? This little cube, and what if I wanted to simply just make a hole in it, okay? Making a hole in something, especially a subdivision surface object, is not a trivial process. It's really kind of difficult, especially when you need to ensure that there's tangency all across the surface, okay? Shoot, let's do this on a sphere so it's a little bit more easy to see what's going on, okay? So I got my, I got my cube, okay? There's my cube. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller, and maybe I just want to, like, take off the corner here. 
Well, mesh fusion, so this is kind of what I'm after. I want to just kind of remove the corner of my sphere. Like that. So where you see the sphere is going to be subtracted from our mesh. Well, mesh fusion allows us to do this pretty quickly. Let's make a new fusion. And, oops, subtract first from the others. There we go. It's going to think about it for a second. Oops, and I messed up my layer order. But that's okay, because it's doing the exact opposite now, which is fine. Okay. And what it's doing is it's using that sphere to interactively subtract its shape from the volume of our cube. This is, a, this is a Boolean. This is precisely what a Boolean is doing. Now, this in itself is cool, right? We're just subtracting uh, a, a portion of our sphere from our cube. But the thing that's worth the price of admission is that I can go in and continue to edit my little sphere whenever I want. And it's going to have an update, an immediate update on the object inside of Moda. I can even go into a polygonal section here and maybe deform it. Okay, pretty cool, huh? I love it. This is the future of, uh, this is the future. <laughs> this is the future, and uh, let's see. There used to be a cylinder in here. There it is. So maybe I want to go in and let's just do this. What if I wanted to have a hole going down the center of my guy? Well, I can do that pretty quickly. Okay. Just grabbing it. Grabbing my cylinder, subtracting it from my mesh. Just thinking about it. There it is. Perfect hole within a second. Okay. And if I needed to change the size of my hole after the fact, I could simply do that by going into the original component piece and changing the size of my hole. Of course, this goes the opposite direction. We can also add things in pretty quickly onto the mesh. It works uh, on subtractions and adds and does intersections. Uh, you know, try, maybe I wanted to add in a cone. Or let's have fun with it. Maybe I want it to be, maybe I need to have a little doohickey coming off the side of this, this guy. And I wanted it to be kind of protruding like that for whatever reason. This is kind of silly. Well, I can add that cone piece into my fusion tree. It's going to interactively add it. Okay. It's pretty cool, huh? It's pretty cool. You can also do this, which is pretty neat. Let's go into my fusion options here. Have it generate some strips for me. Add strip items. Let's kind of think about it for a second. There we go. Now I get to control the transitions between each one of these, these elements. That right there is groundbreaking. <laughs> That's worth the price of admission. Exactly, exactly. Modeling that transition with, traditionally to, with traditional tools would have been, oh, I don't know, impossible. And, oh, what if I need to go back in and make a change to it? Well, I can just go grab that, uh, what is it? It's the cone. And I can move it. And all that strip stuff is gonna is gonna update. Can rotate it. Let's go into my polygonal selection here. It's all gonna update. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Future future of the Boolean system instead of Moto. It's great. It's really, really great. I I, I found myself not being able to live without mesh fusion anymore. It's phenomenal. It's really, now I can stop thinking about polygons and just start thinking about form and volume and planes. And I, initially, you're always gonna have to go back in and retopologize it and create good geometry. Because what it spits out is usable geometry. I mean, I could render this as is without, without any problems, but there's just gonna be a ton of geometry in there. To get me to this final result uh, is, is pretty intense. I mean, I can render it. There it is. There it is in all its glory. But it's a significant chunk of geometry. Yeah, it's 14,000 geometry. So it's got almost 15,000. Not really. Not really. This is the lowest quality. This is the lowest quality. And you can see that it comes at a significant hit in render time, too. 
Now I could I could export this and bake it out. Let's see, that took uh, what twenty four seconds. What happened? Oops, I didn't want to duplicate it. I want to duplicate and convert. There we go. Let's try rendering it now. This is the con converted fusion. Yeah, much faster. Pretty cool. For uh, five seconds, opposed to twenty-four. So once you get spit out true pieces of geometry, opposed to the magic of the fusion, uh, it gets you some much better results. And if you go back and forth between them, there's a uh, you know geometrically they're identical. The light is a little, and that's just a material thing. And it makes sense that the light is darker on the on the fusion one because there's actually a number of different things that's in fa impacting the materials that are currently applied. So it kind of makes sense why it's a little bit darker. So Booleans are rad. I love me some Booleans, OK? Um, you guys are going to continue working with Booleans um, for the construction of your house, OK? Now, this is, now, the house that you're going to make, I would encourage you to make your own house. Don't continue working on this one, OK? Because this one was kind of the, the scratch one. This is, this is the model. This is, our, this is a throwaway model, OK? Because I know that you guys made a lot of mistakes just now, OK? I want the model that, you, that you're going to build to be a good model, because you're, you're going to be living with this model for a couple weeks. Next week, we're going to come back in, and we're going to texture this thing. We're going to add plants and bushes and fence posts and a car in the driveway, and really kind of round out the, ob the scene to make a whole series of really great renders. So the geometry needs to be dialed in and perfect. So I would like, in every sense, for you to restart what you've created here today and make something that matches your own personal you know, expectations of the design. It, and that's why I think it's, you know, starting over is a good idea, okay, for, for your homework assignment. Start with a new house, take everything that we've learned today, and apply it to a new design. Because a lot of this stuff that you've been working on, you failed, you made mistakes, okay, which is good for in class, but for your homework, it needs to be perfect, or as close to perfect as we can be, okay? There are a couple parameters for our homework that we need to look at before you can start. Let's go back over the class blog and take a look at some of the assignments, okay? Now, I'm going to remove geometry for trees and bushes, but I do want you to make the geometry for all your landscape, okay? I need your house to be in a location, okay? You just can't be floating in a gray environment anymore. We want to put our house in an environment, okay? And you're free to go in and use any of the tools that we've learned about in class thus far to help create that environment at the, at the very... Huh? You know, try to, what we're trying to get, no, don't put it on a tabletop. You know, try to, we're, we're going to, yeah, we're, we want this to look like a real house, as if we were to go outside and take a picture of it when we're done, okay? So think about, you know, a driveway. Think about curbs and streets, and think about a lawn, your backyard, fences, things like that, okay? Start adding those geometric details now. Next week, I'll show you a really great process of very quickly going in and adding trees and bushes. So I'll remove trees and bushes from the assignment, um, but you're making the geometry for a house, and the geometry for a landscape, okay? That's what the expectations between now and next week are. Just the geometry, don't worry about textures, okay? The lab, the lab is gonna help you figuring out um, what your house is gonna look like. We wanna, we wanna have every single model that we create be founded in reference. So your job over the next 30 minutes is to scour the internet, to find as many good usable reference photos as you can that will help you construct your house. Now these could be reference photos on details, like what the windows look like or what the roof shingles look like. But they could also be reference images on floor plans and elevation. These reference images will ultimately help you work faster, OK? Because everyone knows what their house is going to look like, right? Or everyone has an idea of what your own house is going to look like until I ask you to make it. And then your house turns into this really weird, you know, cancerous, you know, thing all of a sudden that doesn't look anything like a house at all. If we have pictures at the core of our, uh, to serve as the core of our, of our model, it's going to be much more accurate. All good 3D models begin and end with reference. And if you want to choose to build some other house that you don't currently live in, these reference images are critical. Point being, you can't freestyle this, okay? You got to use reference. Yes, absolutely. 
Okay, yes, you will be submitting these. At the conclusion of your, and you can do this, I would like you to spend maybe 20, 30 minutes, okay? Just going through, find as many reference images as you can. It shouldn't take you too long to, to get a good understanding of what your house is going to look like. Zip them up, submit them to the Dropbox on D2O. Are we doing the inside of the house? Good question, just the outside. Just the, the inside, that'd be a whole other ball of wax. Just the outside. I love it, and that's great. I think that's a fantastic idea. If you want to build your own house, go home, take some pictures of it, zip them up, sub into the Dropbox. You don't have to build your own house, by the way. I think it's most people like to build their own house because they get to see it every day, right? You know exactly what it looks like, but you're going to need some sort of photographic reference to help you. Okay, how do you zip the file? On a Mac, it's really easy. Okay, on a Mac, you just right click on any file or folder, and there's going to be a little contextual option here. So, compress right there. That's it. You compress it, it's going to be zipped up. Okay, on a PC, I think you have to do, you right click on it, you right click on a folder, and then I think it's send to, and then zipped art, zip folder. Yeah. So, you can do it on, on Windows now, too. To kind of help you illustrate the, what we're going for and all this, let me show you a project that I've been working on for probably far too long. Oops. Okay. So this is how nerdy I am. I'm building a 3D model of our campus, right? Because I'm a super nerd and this is what I do in my spare time. Okay. I practice what I preach. <laughs> okay. I practice what I preach. That's why you had a camera. That's why I had a camera, taking all these funny pictures. And let me tell you, if you want to get more crazy looks on campus, walk around buildings, take pictures at them. People will look at you like you are just legitimately crazy. One thing, it's coming along quite nicely, actually. I haven't had an opportunity to work on it as much as I would like to recently. Uh, but it's coming along nicely, very nicely. Now, if you look at the pictures and look at the way I've taken these pictures, I'm trying to capture the overall shape. I'm not getting super close up on the details. I'm staying pretty wide intentionally so I get a really good understanding of how all the planes of my house are working together. It also allows me to get a good understanding of the location, the relationships of all of these details, the spatial relationships. How far are the doors away from the windows? How far are the doors away from the other doors, okay? The reference photos are gonna give me that information. Without any sort of uh, you know, architectural blueprint, I had to kind of create all this stuff on my own. At times though, taking photographs of details is really important because really the devil's in the details. That's where a true success lies. If you want it to look real and accurate, the details have to be real and accurate. So taking a, a photograph of, of specific detail every once in a while is a good idea, including things like electrical bo boxes and junction boxes and things like that. And if you're in the street like I am, just make sure you don't get run over. And definitely don't put your finger on top of the lens. <laughs> just make sure you're trying to capture, uh, you know, when, when I go in close like this, I'm not trying to take a picture of the wall, I'm taking a picture of the windows. And specifically, all the molding detail around the window, because that's something that I want to easily, you know, that's something that I can and should recreate quickly in the computer. And now I'm back. 180 around the entire house. Okay. You are making the entire house. Okay. So your object has to work from a number of different perspectives. You're not modeling just the front yard of your house. You're modeling the front, the back, everything, but just the outside. Don't worry about the inside. If we were to if we were to do the inside, that'd be a whole other ball of wax. It really would. The complexity level increases ever so slightly and you have to build the inside in addition to your outside. Okay, questions? Details are good, like lights. Yeah, a dozen or so. You know, ultimately, as many as you think you need to complete this project. I think, I think if we're right around that 10 to 12 mark, we're in a good, good starting point. Or we're at a really good starting point, excuse me. Just pictures, yeah. But if you can, I mean, if you can, if you can find architectural drawings of the house you're going to build, even better. Even better. 
Floor plans are out there. Doing some good detective work on Google will yield you some really strong results. OK, questions on what we're, doing, what we're going to be doing for our homework in our lab. Everyone understand? All right, we've got about uh, 20 minutes left in class. Let's get to work. Yeah.